Xbox On. Welcome to Xbox On, a podcast with one host about one console. Xbox. I am said host, Jesse DeRosa, and on today's episode, we'll be talking about the latest Xbox news for the week of October 21st, 2021, including an update from Compulsion Games on their next project, Splinter Cell may finally be making its return, Halo's co-creator is forming a new studio with EA, and more. Happy Surface Duo 2 launch day. That's right. Thursday, the day you're listening to this, the next Xbox phone, the Surface Duo 2, is now out. It's live. It's available. Mine still isn't. Last night, I'm like, what? No, this is actually a pretty beefy week of podcast uh, news. And then this morning, I was like, you know what? I don't think I got that many comments on the show, though. So that, you know, balances out. And then I was like, oh, wait, there's all these other comments I forgot about. So we got a big chunk of comments. And they got a big chunk of news. And then right before I started recording the show, I was like, you know what? I should check up and see if anything happened the past few hours since I last looked at my notes. And lo and behold, like seven new stories came out. So like, fuck, man, we got... This is a great problem to have. Don't get me wrong, but strap in, bitches. This isn't going to be a follow me on Twitch, like me on Instagram kind of day. This is a... This is a put on your hats and sunglasses and buckle up because we're going we're going full steam ahead. We're going to talk all about what's happening with your Xbox. Uh, we're going to get right down to the nitty gritty. We're going to find out wh- how the little hamster inside your Xbox Series X runs so fast that your games load at an almost imperceptible rate. It's it's all it's all happening right now. So here we go. First, we want to jump into our corrections, things to address. Now, as you know, this this part of the show has been ever evolving as of late. Uh, it's not so much corrections. I mean, we have them when there are things to correct. But lately, it's been a lot of like, hey, did you hear this? Did you see about this? Kind of like small news stories. And this week, we've got a, quite a handful. So a couple things I want to just throw out there. Literally, as I'm recording this, we just got a new teaser trailer for Starfield. Who, who the fuck was expecting this? You know, like Xbox. Where was this during your, you know, your fucking Gamescom showcase? You know, why couldn't you have this back then? I don't know. But here we are on a random fucking Wednesday in October getting it. And it's, and I'm not complaining. It's awesome. But yeah, we just got a new little teaser of Starfield. You should go check it out. It's only a minute and a half long. Um, not too, too much. There's no gameplay shown. It's just a, a, like some arts, um, some art pieces. It's kind of like a little dev diary, if you will. And then she's a little bit of that cinematic we already saw from E3, but there's a lot of information given. This is a video that tells you a lot about the world, the situation you're in. It's in the 2300s. You're in a, a solar system about 50 light years away from ours. Uh, and it takes place in a relatively contained, obviously it's going to be a big open world, but a relatively contained portion of the universe, not a massive multi-solar system kind of layout, travel, no man's sky, go wherever you want kind of thing. So I do like that they're picking, they're targeting a specific place and kind of focusing in on making a big open world around that rather than it being a bunch of like travel anywhere and everywhere you want. And it's, you know, it's, it's typical sci-fi stuff where it's like, oh, these two factions that kind of like, you know, we're at war with each other and now, you know, things are somewhat amicable, but there's still a lot of tension between these two factions and blah, blah, blah. You work for this, uh, this, I think it's a company or something that is just out there exploring the universe, trying to answer mankind's questions, which is pretty fucking cool. And blah, blah, blah. That's kind of the setup of the game. And you know, all that's like well and fine, pretty typical sci-fi shit. Right. But Oh man, like they're showing like concept art for like what like random villages will look like and towns and different character art and different like just random alleyways and shit. I'm like, dude, this, you know, when we first saw it, it kind of looked like Fallout in, in outer space with like that like retro future with that like yeah retro future kind of thing going on. And I was like, okay, that's cool. It's not you know it's very Bethesda, but it's not what I was initially expecting. It looked from what we saw, it looked very Fallout meets outer space. And that's it, it, but what what we're seeing here in this little teaser is a lot of like more like high techy uh, cyberpunk type environments. There's some I got a lot of like cyberpunk 2077 and like Star Wars vibes from some of the artwork shown in this trailer. So I think it's very interesting showing a, a different side of this world we hadn't 
been introduced to and i think it's definitely worth a quick minute and a half watch so definitely be on the lookout for that that's probably some of the more exciting news to happen in xbox uh, as of late because you know getting a, a new taste of one of our upcoming exclusive titles the other thing i want to mention just at the top of the show because this is just this the whole world is absurd the fact that we're even here talking about this um but whatever the xbox series x mini fridge it's real did you did you get one so i'm not bringing this up to brag or anything but Yes, late last week, they are like, yeah, remember we promised we'd make, you know, that that meme about the Xbox Series X looking like a refrigerator, then we turned it into, like, a meme, then we turned it into, like, a real thing, then we said we were actually going to make the fridge. Well, guess what? Now, we're going to put it out on sale, pre-orders go live, blah, 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 this day, what have you. So, immediately, the whole world's like, oh, my God, okay, the Xbox mini fridge is going on sale, let's pre-order it, let's do it. And, and my first impressions are like, okay, this is going to be another one of those, like, Sells out in 10 seconds, no one can get one, everyone's pissed off things. And yes, it's exactly how this went, but a couple things. Again, not to brag, I, I just got really, really lucky. Usually I don't have good luck with these things, but this time I just so happened to get lucky. I, I was clicking and refreshing the link minutes before it went live, and so I just managed to get the link right as it went live, not like a minute afterwards. And I, I, I was you know, fortunate enough to actually secure one of these pre-orders, which I know is incredibly frustrating because a lot of, a lot of people were there like within seconds of it going live and just missed out anyway. So not a great rollout. Although the good news is they said, this is not a limited release. This is a thing they will continue to make for the foreseeable future. So there will be multiple runs of this fridge. If you missed out, you are not shit out of luck. There will be other opportunities to get it. So that's good news. But I just want to say $99 for an Xbox series X mini fridge. You know, it holds about 12 cans of soda. 12 Mountain Dews will fit in this bad boy. I think that's a good deal. You know, like a, a comparable mini fridge of that of that size and, and those stats generally will run you like 70, 80 bucks US. Um, so the fact that they're only selling it for $100 for this Xbox branded, Xbox licensed mini fridge, I think is a steal. I feel like they absolutely could have gotten away with like $200, $300 for this thing. But they uh, they did the right thing. They they priced it pretty modestly and pretty conservatively for what it is. Hopefully, you know it's not a cheap piece of shit that breaks, and that's not the reason. You know, hopefully that's not the reason why it's so cheap. But I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm actually pretty looking forward to this. Normally, I don't cave into these kind of stupid things. I don't love the idea of like, hey, we made a an Xbox looking refrigerator because it was a meme. I don't like that concept. But the reason I bought this is because I've actually. I've actually wanted to have a mini fridge. You can ask my childhood best friend. I've wanted to have a mini fridge since I was like in the sixth or seventh grade for some fucking reason. It's like always been one of those weird, you know, it's like, it's normal for a boy to be like, oh, I've always dreamed about owning a Corvette or I've always dreamed about, you know, uh, owning, I don't know what a, what a guy is like, a, 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 a $10,000 uh, gaming PC rig, you know, like one of my weird aspirations has always been to like own a mini refrigerator, you know? And I remember like in high school, got my first job and everything. And I was like, dad, I'm going to buy a mini fridge for my bedroom. He's like, like hell you are like, no way you're putting that in my house. And so I just, I never got one, but this is like, I feel like it's just one of those things. I've always wanted to do it. Never did it. It doesn't really make sense living in a tiny apartment to have a mini fridge, but this is a long-term investment. Of course, I will get many years of enjoyment out of this. This is something my kids, my grandkids will probably use one day. So I feel like I'm finally doing 12 year old Jesse a solid by investing in the xbox series x mini fridge and i'm really looking forward to getting one if you got one let me know i'm excited for you you know and if and if you're a little salty right now because the pre-order situation was handled horribly as always is the case with these kinds of things then uh try not to be too upset because there will be many other opportunities to get this thing so just want to put that out there. i don't know i just thought that was what a, what a fucking ridiculous world we live in where like people are equally upset about not being able to pre-order a mini fridge <laughs> As they are about, like, not being able to get a PS5. I just, I, I don't understand what's going on. Next up, <laughs> so this was a kind of stupid thing that happened. Um, some some misleading tweets that literally didn't have to happen. That just happened anyway, just to get people's hopes up and then crush them. Because the world is full of stupid brands trying to be cool on social media. Uh, on Sunday night, the Xbox Game Studios publishing Twitter account tweeted the following saying we're excited to kick off some special something special tomorrow just give us one more day to prepare the chickens with a chicken emoji which is obviously a call out to fable because because you know what xbox ip is like synonymous with chickens i haven't even played a fable game and i fucking know it's fable you know everyone knows like the 
the the British people talking about like, are you just gonna stand there like a chicken or lemon or whatever the fuck it is they say? Like, I I understand the chicken fame and popularity associated with the Fable brand. So the fact that anyone thought this was anything other than Fable, it, it would I don't know, I don't even know what I'm saying. But it, you know, obvious assumption, right? And then the next day, the, uh, the the same Twitter account follows up and it's just like, oh wait, sorry if we confused any of you guys. We actually don't have any big news tomorrow or any info about Playground Games' upcoming uh, Fable reboot. Like, what the fuck? It's like, why were you teasing? What was the special thing you wanted to talk about tomorrow? It's just like an absolute like tease for no reason whatsoever. So, I don't know. I, just, I already always hate the fact that like brands are trying to be so cute and cool on social media. Like, I actually, I actually think... Nintendo and PlayStation are way more palatable on like Twitter and stuff like that and, and Instagram than companies like than brands like Xbox because Xbox falls into the category of like KFC and Wendy's and those motherfuckers that are all just like, oh man, we can't wait to tweet with the GameStop account and be funny and really cool and have get lots of likes and lots of attention from like brain dead people who just think like we're regular people like you and me, but we're actually like multi billion dollar companies. Uh, and I, I fucking hate that. I'd rather the Xbox account just be like plain Jane, boring as shit. Just like, um, we're so excited to share additional information this following week about our new games that are coming in fiscal year uh, 2022. Like, stay tuned for more information. I'd rather have that kind of lame-ass social media presence. And you would think Microsoft's brands of all would have that. But no, it, like, it extends to all of Microsoft's social media accounts. They're all equally cringy and obnoxious like that but this is just one of those things it's like stop fucking cock teasing your your stupid audience and and, and be like oh we're gonna tell you cool shit why would you say we have an exciting announcement tomorrow allude to one of your most beloved franchises and then be like oh sorry sorry we got your hopes up we actually have like literally nothing to say so just wanted to just wanted to share that as the kids would say share that l with all of you guys on behalf of xbox game studios publishing twitter account which doesn't even need to exist, let alone be tweeting stupid shit like that out. So there's that. And then here's one. The, 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 let's let's kind of focus on this. Phil Spencer had a discussion with the Wall Street Journal this week. And then Matt Booty was on um, Kind of Funny's podcast this week. And so we have a lot of interesting little bits and quotes and takes from both of them regarding a couple of conversations. So just want to dive into those real quick. Uh, lots of actually inf interesting information. Um, in an otherwise dull week, this would kind of be the, the the meaty news. But here we are just kind of talking about this as small news before we even get into the proper podcast itself. Guys, I wasn't kidding with you when I said we got a big podcast. This is not the Xbox Game Studios uh, publishing Twitter account. Uh, cock blocking you, cock teasing you, whatever it is. What the fuck is just, just teasing you? Why do I got to be cock teasing you? I don't know. I just got a lot of news to share with you. So. In that discussion with Wall Street Journal between Phil Spencer and, 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 and the WSJ, you know, and this is just kind of a transcription of it because obviously Wall Street Journal and stuff's paywalled behind a subscription, which I don't have or use. So this is all translated via VGC, which is one of my increasingly more used sites these days. But anyway, in regards to like continuing to grow the amount of studios that Xbox owns, Phil Spencer, you know, kind of respond to that question, talking about how he says, I'm really proud of some of the creators that have chosen to become part of Xbox. So many of these creators, they have choice. If you look at some of the people we've acquired and partnered with, it's people we've had long-term relationships with. They've come inside of Xbox now and they see our roadmap on platforms and services. And I want them to be able to do the most amazing creative work as part of this team. We offer some financial stability for them. It's not about the success of their next game. It's not about only the success of their next game. I want to give them some more creative capability, longer timelines when required to do their best, as we saw with Psychonauts 2. And that's my goal. We're we're big believers in the power of content. You've heard Satya Nadella talk about it, Amy Hood talk about it, etc. So we're always on the lookout for people we think would be a good match uh, and teams that would be a good match with our strategy. So we're definitely not done acquiring yet. That said, there's no quota. There's no kind of timeline where I have to acquire studios by a certain amount of time. But if we find a studio that we have a good fit with, we share what we're trying to do and what they're trying to do. And if we feel that we can both get to get, get better together, absolutely. It's one of those privileges we have of being Microsoft and having the capability to take long-term approach and adding creators to the portfolio is important to an important part of that. I like this. I'll say this. I, as much as I'm on team Microsoft, please stop fucking buying studios and just buckle down with what you have and focus on getting good shit out. I, I respect and appreciate Phil's candor despite, you know, 
this statement along with all of his fucking statements in every interview he's in just sounding so incredibly PR trained and rehearsed because let's be honest, he's he's very, very wordy in, in, a, in an attempt to sound very like PR trained and not not very uh not very like natural like a normal human would talk but that being said i think if you dig through it there's a lot of candor here which i i actually appreciate and i know it sounds kind of like um it sounds like an oxymoron but here we are basically him saying you know i'm not actively trying to buy this studio or that studio seeking out specific studios it's just one of those things of like where if the stars align this company is doing this it really aligns with our vision we think there's an opportunity for us to step in and help improve them and also for it, their vision and their brand to help strengthen xbox then you know maybe that's one of those things and i th i feel like we kind of see that story that that being being weaved uh throughout the already pre-existing acquisitions they've made with like you know psychonauts 2 we we were told that from from um tim schaefer the creator of the game himself that you know basically the game was a lot more bare bones before microsoft stepped in gave them all that more time and money and then they were basically like okay we can go add in a whole lot more story a whole lot more content and make a whole lot more of a fleshed out full f experience with this game because we have the time and the money from Microsoft to go ahead and do so, and we and we see that with uh, you know with Beth with the Bethesda acquisition where it's like you know they didn't just randomly go okay we need to buy someone big who's big Bethesda's big let's buy him it was one of those like hey this is a company that has a very long storied history with us there's a lot of like analogs but there's there's a lot of like parallels between like Bethesda and getting into the console space and that always being associated with Xbox and their games always being heavily associated with Windows and Xbox and with their games always being uh, always running and looking best and being optimized mostly for Xbox and being marketed with Xbox. There's a long-standing history there, and you know, and they own a lot of the older PC game developers like ID and whatnot, and old brands like Wolfenstein, which are really heavily associated with like Windows PC gaming, which is all Microsoft, which is all Xbox, and so there's that kind of history and, and natural fluidity there. So I, I think the the track record already does kind of speak for itself with what he's saying, and I do believe what he's saying. I just don't like the fact that he's basically out here saying like, yeah, we're, I mean, we're not done. We're not done. I, I, I kind of wish his response was like, we're done for now. You know, I'm not saying that we won't ever buy another studio, but you know, for now, I think it's time to focus. I, I would just like to see him say for now, it's time to double down on all this great talent we've acquired in such a short period of time and really focus on letting these brands flex their muscles, show what they're made of, do what they want to do and use, because, because I like what he says here about saying that's one of the privileges of being at Microsoft is having the capabilities to take long-term approaches and adding amazing creators to the portfolio. Because what he's basically saying is we're Microsoft. We have tons and tons of money. We can afford to take our time and put money into these things and do what we want to do and take risks and take chances and be really creative and wonky because we have all the fuck you money in the world to justify doing so. And so I, I appreciate that level of candor. I appreciate that outwardness. But again, I also wish he was just like, hey, I mean, like we just we just like quadrupled times 10 in size, you know, with all of our teams and, and, and staff and employees like we're just going to take some time to figure out what Xbox looks like going forward now that we've gone from like a handful of studios to like a fucking uh, pillowcase full of Halloween candies like size uh, grab bag of students. What the fuck am I even saying? But you you, you know what I mean? Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, we've known Phil has teased that they're not done with adding more studios to the roster. So I don't find that that bit entirely shocking, although um, it is mildly disappointing for me, someone who just wants to see them kind of slow down. But in the same breath, I also see that as them saying like, hey, we're not like super aggressively seeking shit out. So maybe we are going to see a slowdown. I, I think either way, we are going to see a slowdown. I mean, we haven't really gotten a studio acquisition in a year or so. Hopefully we can continue to see that be kind of more of a, a rare one-off thing and less of like, a, oh man, it's been six months since they bought someone out. Yeah, it's, maybe it's time for, for another acquisition, you know? Uh, but in that same interview, uh, Spencer was also asked about Xbox and VR again. And this is another one of those things we've talked about many times on the show before, especially in the earlier days of this podcast. This came up quite a bit. And Phil, Phil jumps into that by basically stating that while he admires, you know, companies like PlayStation, Oculus, and Valve, and all these things for jumping into VR, that's not really Xbox's focus, and that they're kind of remained on the software, which is, again, what he said in the past. But his quote was, 
I think that when we think about immersion, we think about mixed reality, virtual reality, and even the metaverse, which seems to be the buzzword of the day now. We're big believers in the software um, the platform and that these devices will enable that. Absolutely, but we're focused a lot more on software in general right now. When I think about immersive worlds and I think about the connective, the connection of the players and the community, that's something that's very high in our investment list. I think that the hardware innovation that's happening is great and it's an important enabler right now, but deciding to stay more on the software side of that enablement, I believe it will scale better in the long run. And you know, I applaud Sony what they're doing, Oculus, Valve, what they're doing. I mean, that's a lot of good players out there and they've done some amazing VR work. But yeah, we're going to stay as a company right now in the consumer space, focus on software, and I think that's a good bet. Again, I appreciate that candor. I... I because this is the thing is Phil, Phil's gotten in trouble, right, in the past for being a little too, like, shy, right? We talk about the the exclusivity situation between, like, Bethesda games and, and, and whether or not they're ever going to come to PlayStation and which ones and all that. And Phil's gotten, gotten some flack, sometimes from me, sometimes from other people, a lot of times just from the general chatter on the internet about whether or not he's just he's, he's being direct or not. And I feel like his stance on VR has always been incredibly direct. He's just like, guys... I know, you know, it's one of those things like you want to see an Xbox VR headset. I get it. You know, it's like Apple made a computer and a phone and then they made a whole little a whole little ecosystem. Like you can also get the earbuds, you can get the watch, you can get the tablet. And then other brands start doing the same. You can do the same with Samsung. You can get their earbuds, their phone, their computer, their whatever. I love the Microsoft products. I wish I could have a Surface watch and all that stuff. But I do have the Surface earbuds that go with my Surface phone and my Surface laptop. It's the same thing. They want the whole ecosystem. I think a lot of that kind of mentality translates over into the game space as well, where you see someone's doing something, so they should do it as well. I think the older, more historical example of this would be the handheld space. Sony used to have handhelds, and you used to always see people bitch in the in the PSP days, like, why doesn't Xbox have a hand, handheld? You know, the Game Boy and the DS line have always done well. For Nintendo, why doesn't Xbox have a handheld? I feel like that's what, kind of what VR is. It's that same thing where it's like, I want that continuity, I want that ecosystem with my brand the way that the other brand has it. So people are like, Xbox, where's our VR headset? Sony has one, therefore we should have one. Nintendo gives you a fucking cardboard box and lets you call that VR. Why can't we have a VR headset? And... I appreciate Phil just being like, yeah, but that's not what we're focused on. And this kind of plays into my overall conversation I bring up from time to time about Xboxes, you know, say what you will about who's got the, the blockbuster games. And I know at the end of the day, the games are the most important thing, but Xbox really is the more like, I will say, pioneer, independent, spearheaded type brand of the games industry. Like where we are today with internet-based gameplay, that's Xbox. Where we are today about the way we in interact with services and online connectivity and things like that in video games and marketplaces and OS dashboards and shit like that for your consoles, that's Xbox. All of that stuff, Xbox is what innovated that stuff. Making video game consoles more about entertainment machines outside just DVD players, that's Xbox. I feel like Xbox doesn't get enough credit for these kinds of things, and I feel like this just kind of plays into it, right? Like, think about, think about the way the handheld thing worked out, right? Because... 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we were all bitching. Why isn't there an Xbox handheld? PlayStation has one. Nintendo has one. Well, how did that work for those guys, right? Think about it. PlayStation went on to do a second handheld. It failed. They got out of the handheld business. Nintendo kept doing worse and worse with their home consoles, and only their handhelds were succeeding, so they had to kind of converge the two things into one, and that's where we are with the Switch today, where they only have one product now. They don't even have a dedicated handheld market anymore. They just have the console that is a portable as well. And we're in this world where, like, the mobile space kind of killed that. And, you know, phones, it didn't kill handheld gaming, but it turned it into much more of a niche kind of product. And so now in 2021, it actually looks really smart to say, well, Xbox never got involved with handheld gaming because it just didn't make sense. And now they look like kind of the smart ones there. I think Microsoft in general are usually pretty good. You know, they're very... Believe it or not, for a tech company, they're pretty techy. They're pretty ahead of the curve with these things. They're usually pretty good at looking down the road and saying, this is where the market's going. This is where the audience is. This is what's worth, what's worth investing in. And this is what the future is. Remember, the whole purpose of the Xbox to begin with 20 years ago was Xbox saying, we don't want to cede the living room to Sony. You know, we won the office. The, the Windows PC beat out Apple and it won the office space. Everyone has a Windows computer in their office, whether it be at home or work. Now we want to win over the living room. We don't want Sony to beat us there. And that was the whole purpose of the Xbox. And I think this is a similar thing where it's like VR is very niche, kind of like what handheld gaming became. It's very insular. It's very like you think about 
like sitting around with a VR headset on your head. It might be one of the coolest gaming experiences ever, but it's not in the spirit of what Xbox is all about, of what their gaming initiative is all about, which is bringing in as many players from all over everywhere and making gaming as accessible and doable for all as humanly possible, right? VR kind of does the opposite of that. It makes it a very niche specific way to game for a very specific type of person that can only do it by themselves. And it's just not really in the spirit of Xbox. It is kind of a niche thing and it just doesn't really make sense for their, their thing overall. But you look at like the other things Xbox is doing that maybe the other competition either isn't doing at all or isn't doing nearly as well. xCloud, right? You know, game streaming. Why Why is Xbox in the, uh, the the mobile handheld game market? Because you can just stream Xbox on your fucking phone now. And that is a much better way to reach a wide audience. And you don't have to like it. I understand it's hardcore gamers, like people like myself even. You might think of something like VR to be a little more exciting than something like trying to play Gears of War 5 on your fucking Samsung Galaxy with touch controls. It's weird, right? I get it. Don't get, don't get me wrong. I get it. But if you're talking about trying to expand gaming to a wider audience, get out there to more people, make it more accessible, make it more for everyone, so investing in something like xCloud makes way more sense than trying to jump in and be the top dog in the VR space. Which, again, like I like I like to think VR isn't going anywhere and that's it's only going to become bigger and bigger. But, you know, we've been waiting for this VR wave to just blow up and take off for like five or six years now. And it just... It does well, like Sony's PlayStation VR headset actually sold really well and they're making a new version of it. And like Oculus Quest has done very well and all these things, right? But VR has stayed pretty niche. Like I'm a hardcore gamer who buys like everything video game related hardware. I don't have a VR headset. Most people I know don't have a VR headset. Most people that you know probably don't have a VR headset. In fact, I'm get, I'm willing to bet if you're listening to this podcast and you own and, and, and there's any kind of involvement with a VR headset in your circle, chances are you're the one who's played it or owns it and not your friends or family or people in your life. Because again, it's just a very niche product. It's really like hardcore kind of insular gamer product. And, you know, maybe we'll see it blow up and become something more one day. But I think this is really in the spirit of what Xbox is trying to do, and what Microsoft's trying to do to focus more on like the games and the X Cloud and the Game Pass and a little less on like the trying to get one person at a time to put on a headset, you know? But, uh, oh my God, guys, we're, I already lost my voice. We haven't even gotten to the, to the fucking comments. But the other big uh, interview that was happening this week, and this is also relayed from VGC, was with Kind of Funny Games. Matt Booty, uh, Xbox Game Studio boss, and um, said that <clears throat> he basically likened what Xbox is trying to do with, with some of the success PlayStation's had. A conversation we've had on the show many times before saying that the cool thing about Game Pass is that it has a lot of room. It leaves a lot of room for everything from big games like Halo to smaller games like Grounded. And, of course, acknowledging that Xbox somewhat lacks the AAA immersive experiences synonymous with Sony, like your God of Wars and your Uncharted and your Last of Us and all that shit. Uh, so when asked during the podcast if he would like Xbox to have one of those types of games, he responded with, first, just to bring it up, hats off to Sony and their studios, and that the leaders that they've got are there. I mean, it's fantastic. You can't argue with the quality and the craft of the games that they've delivered. They're just working on now the stuff that we've seen so far. So kudos and hats off to them. I tend to come at least uh, less of one of those and more making sure that we are paying attention to the fan expectations. I think that there's a certain kind of game that generates anticipation that becomes the key, the big tentpole moment for gamers. It's a game that fits the intersection that everyone can play, and it's also a big world where you can feel and can inhabit, and I think it's those kinds of games that are important. And certainly, it's been a place where we have not been out in front of. We have really had a sort of uh, one-to-one with Sony there. Sorry, we haven't had a real one-to-one -one with Sony in that regard. I don't necessarily want to go to uh, what's our Uncharted or what's our Horizon Zero Dawn or what's this or what's our that. I don't think that does anybody any good, I agree. But you hit the you hit on a great point, which is which I take away always. What are those games that have got universal themes, that have big worlds where people want to get lost in, that have really well realized characters and really high production values? Absolutely something we want to go after. Okay, so before we continue with the other part of the interview, let's just stop right there. I think okay, let me be just because otherwise I'm going to end up correcting myself next week. This is something I'm guilty of, right? Is 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 harping on this too much because I realize this is a big talking point in the game's conversation, right? Is like the well, where is Xbox's Ghost of Tsushima? Where is Xbox's The Last of Us? And I I used to defend this more and more back in the day, especially where I was like, oh, you know, from my from my experience, I think Gears Five is equally as compelling of a immersive, story driven 
you know, AAA experience to the, to the same extent that like Horizon Zero Dawn is. I just think it's more of a one of these brands is popular like and the other one just isn't right now. But at the same time, you know, this is a conversation we've had many, many times before. And we talked about how that, that's why the initiative was formed. And Xbox wants to have their Last of Us, their Uncharted, their Ghost of Tsushima. And I, I appreciate well, a couple things here. Again, candor. Matt Booty basically just being like, yes, Sony has those kinds of games. And not that we necessarily want to copycat and say, well, this is our open world robot dinosaur game, or this is our post-apocalyptic drama game, but rather like, how can we make a game that has that kind of resonance with audiences? And, and the thing is, the more and more I think about this, the more I'm like, that is Sony's special sauce, right? Is that they make these long ass movies that you want to play. Xbox needs to embrace what makes them different rather than trying to play catch up. And I think they know that. And that's kind of what they're saying here is like, yeah, sure. We want to have a game that resonates with our audience the way God of War 2018 resonates with the PlayStation audience. But at the same time, it's about, because focus, look at what he focuses on. Games with universal themes that have big worlds where people can get, want, where people want to get lost to them with really well-realized characters and really high production values. Well, that describes like fucking like Fallout and whatever Bethesda's making and like Fable and like Halo. I mean, think about it. that's That's like what we're talking about right now as we're here on the precipice of getting Halo Infinite is it's a world people want to get lost in. It is a, it is characters people really, really, identify with and that are fully realized like Master Chief and Cortana and these amazing Halo characters that we've all known to come and love or that we've all come to love and uh it's like how is this not the same thing right the difference is you know something like The Last of Us is like the Oscar bait of video games and that's not to knock a game like The Last of Us it's just like that is a it is a universal all ages kind of like emotional drama type experience. Whereas Halo might be seen as something a little more like a Star Wars or a Marvel movie where it's like, it's big, but it's like a summer blockbuster, geeky, nerdy, fun kind of thing, right? Where it's like, oh, that was cool. Not like, oh, that was a moving emotional experience. Now that's not to say you can't get that experience from Halo, but I think that's the kind of differentiating factor they're trying to pull here, right? Is like, they want their Schindler's List, not their Marvel's Avengers Endgame, right? And so I get that. But I think this is what makes Xbox special is that they have they have the Marvel and the Star Wars thing, right? That's what Gears of War and Halo are. Whereas PlayStation has more of like the Academy Award winning one and done kind of experience. So, you know, like think about a movie like, I don't know, what's a, what's a movie that won an Academy Award recently? I don't fucking know. For some reason, Moonlight's the one that came to mind. I know that was like four years ago or whatever, but I saw Moonlight. It's a great movie. It was a fantastic movie. Absolutely loved that movie. I don't want to watch Moonlight ever again. I understand why that one, I think that one best picture of the year one, right? And I understand why it won best picture. It is a beautiful movie. It has so much to say. And it's one of those movies that leaves you like, just kind of really like emotional and very like vulnerable and just with a lot to think about and a lot to feel. And I love and it. Like a two hour experience like that is one of the greatest things in the world. I get that. And PlayStation has that in video game format. Um, I don't want to play that ever again. Xbox has like the, again, like the Star Wars thing, right? Star Wars is like a movie people love and they grow attached to the world and the characters and they want to watch it again and again and again. And they want more of that universe. And I feel like that's what Xbox has because it's like, Dude, that's what Halo is. Like, I'm going to beat Halo Infinite. I'm probably going to beat the campaign more than once. I'm going to play hundreds of hours of the multiplayer. I'm going to play tons and tons of Forge and all this other shit. And I'm going to have a fucking blast with Halo. Because guess what? Unlike that other really great thing, uh, I, I want to experience this more than once. This isn't going to make me feel like shit. I'm not going to be, like, emotionally ruined every time I play this game. I'm just going to have fun. And I feel like Xbox needs to lean into that more and more because... I think they're the brand with more fun, whereas, yes, Sony is the brand with more, um, like, of a, like a snooty, high-class, artistic slant. And both are great. It's great that both exist. And I think PlayStation could use a little bit of what Xbox has, and Xbox could use a little bit of what PlayStation has. But I, I like what he's saying here, where he's like, yes, we need some of that to an extent, but we don't need to do this thing of, like, one-to-one -one parallels. Like, they have that? Okay, we need our version of that. Oh, they have that? We need our version of that. Because that, that just makes... That just that's just this game of like making sure that you're parallel with your competition rather than being like a unique alternative. And I, I like seeing them be starkly different like this rather than them try to fight to become the better version of the same product, if that makes sense.
All right, the other half of the interview, the other thing that he talked about was the whole Crystal Dynamics working with the initiative. Uh, so as you remember, a few weeks ago, we learned about the situation where a lot of Crystal Dynamics is now going to be working with the initiative on the upcoming Perfect Dark game. Um, former Crystal Dynamics studio head Daryl Gallagher, who now holds the same position at the initiative, used to be in charge of, used to be in charge of Crystal Dynamics back when he was over there. And so in response to kind of this whole situation going on, Matt said, I think we're at a point in the industry where if you've got a big team like Crystal Dynamics that becomes available, which has got a great pedigree, good success, and just a lot of skill and thorough connections, the fact that we got Daryl Gallagher at the initiative who knows some of the folks over there, and now that team is available, going back to what are my jobs day to day, it would just be like this. I'd be remiss not to say we've got to find a way to make this work. We've got a team that's got experience building the, the kind of thing that we're building, who's worked with some of the people that are now available. You know, it's a standard situation because they're like, they're not usually out billing themselves to a sort of co-development studio like many places are, but we found a way to make it work. And I think it, I think it was through some of the personal connections that we've got. So I'm excited about it in terms of what it adds to the team that we're, we already got the initiative. And again, it's too precious of a resource right now in the industry to not jump on what we can figure out some way uh, to get a contract done or whatever we've got to do. So I don't have too much to say this because what he's really adding here is kind of the, the same story we already speculated on, which is just that. It's like, hey, there are pre-existing connections here. Uh, we're going to take advantage of that. It's this thing of, and, and this is something I've been kind of misrepresenting the initiative on, which is that apparently this is always their thing was to stay a nimble, smaller, small to medium sized team and kind of just take on and off work here and there as needed um, on a project by project basis. And I guess this kind of addresses a thing that's endemic in AAA development, which is where you staff up for big projects, like a big game coming out. And then finally, once the game is shipped, once it's out, you kind of downsize the team again and reform based on whatever the next project is. And operating the initiative this way kind of avoids having to do that because it adds that extra help on a project by project, you know, basis. And that way, you know, you're serving this double edged, you're serving this two birds, one stone kind of situation of like, our team stays our core team, no one has to lose their job after a project, but they can just kind of grow and shrink as needed. And then the teams that come in to help them grow when need be are teams that are kind of in between projects or have an excess of staff given the current situation. And that's what we see here where, you know, Crystal Dynamics' most recent game was Marvel's Avengers, came out a year ago. And of course they have a bunch of people working on supporting that game and post-game launch content. But there's also a lot of people who work at Crystal Dynamics, a large developer, who are probably now like, you know, ready to move on to the next project kind of in between jobs. And so this, this kind of gives that team a project to work on in the interim while the rest of the team works on Avengers before they move on to whatever they're going to do next. And it just kind of helps keep things in the industry kind of oiled and efficient and productive in a way that might not matter a whole lot to us, the end user, but in a behind the scenes kind of way, this is a kind of high, you know, just a kind of, th a kind of thing that's going to benefit the back end, you know, the industry itself, the, the developers themselves. So I think that's what this is more and more about. I feel a lot less nervous about this. I guess that doesn't change the fact that this is a new and an innovative thing that we're seeing um, more so because of the type of team that's doing it. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I remain mildly cautious about like what all is going on here, but also a little optimistic about this new approach to how you get work done um, in the games industry, it's, it's cool. All right. And then the other, just two little quick, like seriously quick notes before we jump into the comments. Microsoft has confirmed that it has plans to celebrate Xbox's 20th anniversary in November with a dig digital broadcast. On November 15th, exactly 20 years after the launch of the OG Xbox, uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern time, 10 a.m. Pacific time, Xbox uh, will be streaming a celebration of the 20th anniversary of Xbox and Halo with a fun digital broadcast for fans around the globe. There will not be any announcements of new games. This anniversary broadcast is a special look back of the 20 years of Xbox. More details will be shared soon, so stay tuned. So that is something fun. I'm looking forward to seeing it. I, I love this. It's just a fan service way to celebrate this brand we all love. Not a whole... And, and, and I love that they're just transparent about like, hey, don't expect announcements. This isn't about games. This isn't about announcements. This is just about celebrating the brand's history. So the expectation is set. Therefore, I will not be upset when Paris comes out with sunglasses on to sit and talk about medieval torture or whatever the fuck for 35 minutes. All right, and finally, a little bit of sad news. Namco artist Hiroshi Ono 
better known as Mr. Dotman, has died at the age of 64. He passed away on October 16th after a long illness and is best known as the graphic artist who joined Namco back in 1979, staying on until 2013, long after it admit it merged with Bandai. Better known for classic arcade games that he worked on, including the cabinet and marquee designs for Pac-Man, the iconic Pac-Man cabinet and marquee design, and numerous other logos and pieces of cabinet art for other Namco games, which all began when he worked on the sprites back in the day for Galaga. So... Legendary artist, legendary key art for games. I think absolutely iconic artist when you think about his contributions to the industry. Really sad stuff. 64 is way too fucking young. So just uh, thought I'd read that out out of respect for Mr. Ono and his family. You know, just rest easy, dude. Thank you for the beautiful art and all the great contributions to this industry we all love. Now, guys, we are done with all of our opening news 42 fucking minutes in the show. Let's jump into the comments. You know how it works. You go over to YouTube.com slash c slash xbox on podcast enter that bitch in click on the latest episode of the podcast and leave a comment i'll read it on the air i promise you can say something nice like jesse why the fuck did you do the whole news segment before you did the whole news segment keep up the good work gg i'll say thank you comment red you can say something mean like jesse i expect a little more taco bell information with my xbox podcast unsubscribe and i'll say you're fucking psychotic here's me reading your comment anyway so our first comment this week comes from mr sweaty bandito what the fuck is he talking about? He says, so I had the McPlant twice this week. Perfectly, or sorry, pretty decent. And the vanilla milkshake was way better than I remembered. Just thick enough to maintain the correct suck slash flow ratio. Now, no sexual innuendo included. This is completely serious. The, sluck, the suck slash flow ratio is critical with a, with a milkshake. I absolutely agree. So glad to hear that. I can't even remember last time I had a milkshake from McDonald's or if I've ever had one. I'm a, I'm a McFlurry man. But Sweaty Bandito, what the fuck is the McPlant? I had to look this up. So it is McDonald's new plant-based burger. It's not available in the US. So this is something you guys got over there in the UK. Stop flaunting with what you got. We get it. We get it. You guys are so blessed. You've got old castles and uh, trolley double-decker vehicles running around your really narrow um, roadways and you got tea coming out of your faucets, I assume. I assume you don't have running water. You just have running tea. So I get it. You're just bragging about all the things you got that we don't, sweaty bandito. But uh, no, I am glad you had. Hey, listen, if we had it here, I'd give it a try. But now you're just bragging. All right, we had a couple comments on Battlefield 2042 following last week's reactions to the beta that happened. Dead Captain James says, let's go. I can't tell if he's trying to be like elite gamer, let's go, or if he's trying to be like racist Italian plumber, let's go. Uh, but he says, BF 2042 is as good as, as my hype for it. The beta was buggy, but damn, the gameplay is exactly what I wanted from Battlefield. I saw a lot of people echoing this sentiment, which makes me happy. I'm glad people are happy about this game. I'm glad people are pumped for it. I'm glad that people were able to get past the technical hurdles and understand that like, hey, these kinks will be ironed out, but still able to just be like, hey, it's a beta, whatever, that's just gonna happen. Let me just try to enjoy this game for what it is. And people were able to have a good time and enjoy it. I'm, I, and that makes me happy. I, I am glad for you guys. I stand by what I said last week. I think that game definitely needs a delay. I think it's definitely still Battlefield, so it's not necessarily my cup of tea. But despite the fact that I mostly just died and raged quit and got pissed off playing that game, I still do have an itch to go back and play some more of it. So Battlefield 2042, better than you think. Jared Master says, what's up, Jesse? Love the show. I'm a huge Battlefield nerd. I always have been... I have a battlefield sorry i always have a battlefield on my active game rotation i've been playing lots of battlefield 5 in preparation of 2042 i played the hell out of the beta it got up to like rank 27 or something overall i enjoyed it i feel like it needs a lot of polish and maybe a 10 grit sandpaper in others lol but at the end of the day i liked a lot of the other big chances changes and i'm curious to see what they fix and what they leave in i love running medic I'm a nurse in real life, so it fits me well. I felt the reviving in some of the beta was bro basically broken, so hard to revive someone. I sorely missed my smoke grenades for me. That's like the number one thing I want them to fix so I can keep all my dumbass teammates alive. P.S. Get your hair cut, you hippie. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you for writing in. You know what's funny is I didn't play Battlefield 5, so I can't speak to this, but I remember that being a complaint about Battlefield 5 where people said the medic class was kind of broken, so... Maybe, maybe Battlefield just changed the way the medic class works and, and you're just not a fan of it. I, I'm not sure. But again, here, here it is. You know, despite my criticism, a lot of you guys out there having a good time. Being able to look past my stupid negativity and just be like, this guy's whack. 
Let's go have fun using our Xbox. I'll put my left hand on the left side of the gamepad. I'll put my right hand on the right side of the gamepad. I will grip that gamepad. I will put my thumbs on the off-axis analog sticks and my index fingers over the triggers ready to play. I will keep my head facing my computer monitor and or TV screen, and I will focus and react and, and, and stare at the screen. I will definitely keep my eyes open while I look at the game because that's a good way to play it, and I'm going to play this game and enjoy it despite Jesse being an angry little bitch. And, I, and I'm glad. I'm happy for you guys. But my brother's on my bitchy side. He says, Battlefield 2042, it's scary how bad it runs for something about to release. It looks like inf it looks infinitely worse than Halo Infinite footage we saw last year for a game that got delayed a whole year. Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know about that bad. I, I really don't know. It, it's different. Different kind of bad. They both had different kinds of, ooh, that needs to touch up. But I, I will say, yes, this game desperately needs to get delayed. This game desperately needs to get delayed more than anything. They don't need you know, the game is fine. They need to delay it. Just polish it up, get it right. Do not recreate Battlefield 4. You don't want that PR mess on your side. Plus, 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 this game is gonna look so fucking hot to everyone if it comes out in March and not sandwiched right in between Call of Duty and Halo. I'm just saying, like, even me, who's like not who's like kind of lukewarm on this game, even I will be looking at this game. Like it's a beautiful, a beautiful lady just uh, walking. What was that old sub was subway commercial with like the the guys with the subs and the girl walking down the street and the cat call her. Anyway, if you put this game out in like March when nothing's happening or nothing cool is happening, you know, if it's the big AAA game that steals the show, it's gonna look a lot better than um, just sandwiching itself in between all these other big shooters. You know, whatever. Finding the time to play continuation. We talked about this last week. How do we find the time to play? Tech Daddy brought up the conversation, a great talking point. And, uh, well, I can tell you one thing. You can stop listening to this overly long podcast, and that would save you some gaming time. But Mr. Miggy writes in and says, yeah, fuck $70 games. Okay, that's not really what we're talking about, Mr. Miggy. Also, I feel the same as you do when it comes to playing games. I barely am able to make it past an hour most of the time when I play, and the only kids I have are my cats, which are better than human kids. Okay, agreed? I don't. I wouldn't fuck a $70 game. I don't think being $10 more than other games makes it more fuckable. But I will say that... Yeah, it's it's just fucking hard to find the time to play. It's it's different. Like the the type of energy and focus required to stare at your phone and, and just endlessly scroll social media or to just stare at the TV while Netflix plays before your eyes is an entirely different, lower, easier form of energy to access than the energy required to like, all right, sit upright, pay attention, we're going to play a video game. So it's impossible, Mr. Miggy. It's just, um, we need, uh, th this is why we need more walking sim games because they're easier to digest. We need more telltale games. Count Skyla chimes in and says, yeah, struggling to find time to play games is a massive problem. I basically just have to live vicariously through you. Well, if you're living vicariously through me, you're definitely not experiencing games. I'll say that much. Fortunately, my kids are finally getting old enough to where they want to play games. I've been brainwashing them to be massive Halo fans, and it seems to be working, so hopefully I can combine my family time into my game time here soon. Now, if I could just buy, if I could just get my wife on board. Count Skyla, this is a phenomenal idea. I think this is one of the better suggestions, one of the better quote unquote life hacks to the situation. What you should do is get kids who love video games so you can play video games, but make sure it's the video games you like so you have an excuse. Now, you might be saying, Jesse, I have a two year old right now, a little too young for gaming, but. What if in three years they're not into the games I'm into? You know, what if we're, I'm trying to get them into gaming. And I'm like, hey, here's Halo. What do you think? Hey, here's Army of Two. Maybe we can play co-op together. And then your little shit who's like five years old is like, now I want to play Fortnite. Okay, what do you do? Simple. You put the kid up for adoption. You go to the orphanage. You get a new kid. You take that one home. You find out, what do you like to play? You, you want to play some Halo? You want to play some Left 4 Dead? And this kid goes, no, I want to play Five Nights at Freddy's. Simple. Bring the kid back to the orphanage. Drop them back off. Get a new kid. Repeat the process until you find the right kid. That's all there is to it. I think Scotia has some very sound advice here. Just get the kid that is into the thing you're into, and that way your wife will let you off the hook, and therefore more time to game. I think it is a soundproof idea. It is a foolproof idea. And uh, let's let's see if uh, Mavsman has anything to suggest here, because he writes in and says, Tech Daddy, being a father and a husband, it is definitely difficult balancing that with finding time for video games. I finally set my wife down and told her, this is my me time. It's something she finds incredibly stupid, but it's what I enjoy. So I made a schedule consisting of Tuesday and Thursday nights after work and pretty much all day Sundays around until around 5 p.m. It gives me around 16 hours or so a week to game, keeps me happy, keeps her happy, knowing that these are the set days that I'm on Do Not Disturb. This is 
also effective if you don't want to go the whole adopt a kid route. Yeah, you could just try to... See, the thing is, I love this idea, and this is kind of similar. This is like a more rigid and more strict version of what I do, which is basically just like understand to yourself, like these are the days and times where generally I'm available to play games. Like this is what works for me. Um, but this is definitely a more communicative and more effective way to do it by setting your wife down and setting the expectation and being like, this is what the situation is. This is the game plan. So this is when you know I'm not available. This is when I am available. So that way it's a little more like everyone's on the same page. I like that. The problem with this is sometimes, you know, it's like, okay, here it is. It's Thursday at night. It's my time to play games. This is one of my allotted scheduled gaming sessions. But what if that Thursday comes and you're not in the mood for gaming? But what if Friday night you are in the mood for gaming, but it's not when you're scheduled times? It becomes one of those things of like, Gaming should be something you do when you want to do it, and you're not always going to be in the mood to do it if it's on your scheduled time slot to play games, and it becomes this whole thing of, like, why are you treating gaming the way you treat your work schedule and all this, and then that can conflict as well. So I think in your circumstance, Mavsman, you're probably going to want to go ahead, head down to the orphanage, adopt one of those kids that's into the kinds of games you want, and that way you can play games whenever you want, just as long as your kid wants to do it, because it makes you look like father of the year. Anyway. That's it for the finding time to play games. Guys, we got a battle of tea kind of situation brewing here. No pun intended, but pun intended. Compassionate Choice LLC. That means limited liability cock. Says, just to be clear, just to clear the air, iced tea is far superior to sweet tea. That's why I said last week. So you're in agreement with me. Okay. You're one of the, you're one of the good ones. We'll spare you. Uh, whenever you talk about the CCP, I can't help but think about South Park Season 23, Episode 2. I had to look that up. In fact, my brother looked it up. He said, is that the one where Randy is attempting to get the CCP to allow him to sell weed to China? One of the best episodes ever. Why are we even talking about this? Compassion Choice says, that is correct. Mr. Marsh attempts to bring loads of integrity to China with, <laughs> with the help of Buddy Tally. One of the best. Why am I reading you the synopsis of a South Park episode on my podcast? Because guys we got to fill the airtime now a quick word from our sponsor did you know that 23 percent of men will experience erectile dysfunction by age 40 it doesn't have to be that way ed is optional introducing no i'm just kidding but anyway yeah i don't i don't, I don't know what to say yeah i like i like to bitch about the ccp listen i'll say it again because i always feel i always feel like there's someone out there in the audience who's misunderstanding what i'm trying to say about china and they just think i'm like some complete bigot who hates chinese people china's cool chinese people are awesome china's Great culture, great food, good people. Uh, the Chinese government can literally go fucking suck a dick and die. Chinese government sucks ass. L literally, like, what was that That big news story that was even catching, like, mainstream attention? The whole, like, the government wants to crack down the amount of time people can play games a week. They want to limit to, like, three hours a week that you can play gaming it, it, or that you can game. Is it, it wasn't, wasn't that what it was? It was something abysmal, like, three hours a week or something. Absolute fucking overreach. Like, what? what are you fucking talking about? Telling people they can only play games three... Like, shut the fuck up. But, uh, you know. Whatever. If I gotta sound like that episode of South Park where Randy Marsh gets fucked up with Pooh Bear... That's the one with Winnie the Pooh, right? <laughs> anyway. Uh, Vanguard Zombies. Way of the Lao writes in and says, Yo, what's, what's the good word? I personally swap out the beef on the quesarito for steak because it's like the way God intended. I, too, like the new Call of Duty Zombies trailer. Hopefully that makes up for all the other things everyone else is bitching about. Keep up the good work, my man. Way of the Lao. See, I'm always a sub beef for chicken guy, and you have to come in here and one-up with us all because you're a fucking fancy-ass rancher boy who's like, oh, I got steak, not beef. I'll be honest, I don't remember what Taco Bell's steak is like because I've only tried it like so few times, but um, I feel like I gotta try that. The quesarito was steak, not chicken. Quesarito steak, not beef. I've never had it with chicken either. I've only ever had the quesarito with beef, but I, uh, I'm i intrigued, Wade Lau. You've inspired me. I'm making a proclamation to you the next time I go to Taco Bell, if I remember, we'll try steak instead of, instead of beef on that quesarito because, because you told me to. Well, you didn't tell me to, but you just said that's how you do it, and I want to be like you when I grow up, so there we go. All right. Tech Nerds Food and T-Bell. This is our wrap-up comments. Wrap-up comments. We got three. Okay, here we go. Mojo writes in and says, As a console and PC gamer, I really don't prefer one over the other. I love the simplicity of my Series X, and all I have to do is push the X on my controller, and my TV turns on automatically and signs me in, and boom, I jump right into a game. I'm a giant tech nerd. So I love building PCs, and I'm also currently on my fourth build, and I love every minute of it. I mostly am an RPG and ARPG fan, as well as an indie game and retro fan, so both Game Pass and Steam work perfectly for me. P.S. 
I was at the grocery store the other day in a bakery area and saw that they had crumpets. Like, what the fuck? Has anyone had these? So I have to buy a pack, and they're basically English muffins, if you can cut them in half. So one half is an English muffin, but one half of an English muffin is one crumpet, and their other is more is a little more spongy. I slapped some butter on them, bad boys, and threw them in the toaster oven, and they were awesome. I... I, I'd get them if I if you see, sorry I'd get them if you see them peace y'all okay hold on focus on this first crumpets it's one of those things you know when you're making fun of British people you gotta you gotta say the word crumpet this is an interesting thing I've never really thought about what a crumpet is before it it looks like it's just a fucking English muffin in fact I'm pretty sure it's just a synonym for English muffin is it not in fact hey here we go Bing crumpet verse English muffin. Okay, so there is a difference. Despite the fact that they look almost identical, it looks like an English muffin is more of a braided texture, a crumpet's more of a spongy texture, and then usually an English muffin is cooked on both sides, whereas a crumpet is only cooked on one side, as you described. So, okay, so nothing real there. You know, the crumpet looks almost more like the, um, what is it, the McGriddle? The, those McDonald's buns that are like basically pancakes with syrup infused in the middle? It's kind of what they look like. <laughs> okay, yeah, if I will, now I gotta go out of my way and find a fucking crumpet. Okay, I see. It looks different. It looks spongier for sure. I'm not a huge English muffin fan. If if I have like a legit fresh one, that's fine. I don't really like the ones you buy at the store and just put in the toaster, but I'm, I'm interested. I'll try the fucking English muffin crumpet combo challenge if that's what you recommend to me, Mojo, but you were also talking about video games. Oh yeah, I, I get it. I get it. I prefer the simplicity of gaming on a console. It's just where I always play my games, but I do see the appeal. It's fun for me to make fun of the PC space, but I do see the appeal of getting really nerdy and personal about building and customizing it just so and really making it your own. I, 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 get, I get that appeal. It's the same thing where it's like you can buy a cool car or you can like build your dream car out of like taking a car you love and just tweaking it and tuning it and doing all the shit to it. I, I get it. It's like a passion project versus a, a thing you just inherently love for for what it is. It's 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 fun to have both. But now I can't think about your video game comment because I just can't stop thinking about crumpets versus English muffins. Headhunting Halo says, Jesse, I listened to your advice about the three items at Taco Bell and OMG, that was so good. My fat ass got all three items you recommended. Man, I can tell you, my butthole is booming. The cheesy gordita crunch was the king of the show. Why are you so lazy? Why are you, wait, why are you so lazy to make your own tea? Did you look me up on Chatterbait yet? Only $19.95 a month and don't get excited Though, I'm a grower, not a shower, so don't make fun of me, Tootsie Roll. Big things can come in small packages. My friend, also, I had to agree with you. Danny DeVito's character from Hercules is definitely the hottest Disney character. P.S. Love you and I th and that sugar baby cat. Well, thank you, I love you too, but let's get down to brass tacks. How am I too lazy to make my own tea? I make my coffee in a French press. I could go the easy route. I could be one of those guys. Listen, I'm a very techie person myself, like Mojo. I'm and maybe not a smart when it comes to tech as Mojo is, but I'm very interested in consumer tech products. It's a very big fascination of mine. I love this shit. That's why I'm always blowing stupid money on stupid shit. But here's the point I'm trying to make. I could be all cool and techie. I could buy one of those cool automatic coffee makers and set it up to my Google home and just wake up in the morning and have a routine where I turn off my alarm and like, good morning, Google. And Google's like, oh, here, I turned on the lights for you just the way you like them and I'm making your coffee and I'm playing uh, the Rolling Stones on low volume just like you asked me to for some fucking reason. I could be that guy, but I don't. I get up like a goddamn 17th century Englishman and I walk my ass over to the kitchen and I turn the light on myself and I boil my own water and I scoop my own coffee grounds and I put it in the French press and I let it sit and steep for 10 minutes and then I pour it out myself. I do all that hard laborious work my own self at five in the morning. Why? Because I'm not fucking lazy. I know how to make premium coffee by hand because I'm a fucking artisan. I'm an artist making artisan coffee. Okay. So for you to come in here and be like, why are you so lazy when it comes to making tea? I'm not lazy. I just don't want to make tea. You might ask, Jesse, why don't you build uh, a fucking skyscraper? Why don't you become a world-class architect and engineer and just build the, the most beautiful uh, piece of industrial design, the most beautiful piece of architectural tapestry ever to know to grace the human, the human race? Well, not because I'm lazy, because I don't want to fucking do that, okay? We have choices in this world, headhunting Halo. And when you make one choice, you're making a million compromises. Every choice you make 
is a million compromises, is a million no's. For everything you say yes to, you just said no to everything that you didn't say yes to. Think about it like that. Am I lazy because I didn't make tea? No. I'm a goddamn genius because I made coffee instead. And I made it like a hardworking, dedicated, strong-willed, dare I say, completely ripped Danny DeVito fanboy. Cockfights fighting cocks. What is it? Or uh, cocks fighting cocks. This is about... Last week, our Far Cry 6 discussion, Sam Torres says, So glad you covered the cultural importance of cockfighting. My parents, being from Cuba, muttered something about the PTSDs of their favored sp of their favored sports slash species population control. Cocks busting through their ramshackle windows. Original zombies and almost as deadly as hurricanes. Great job, Mr. Jesse. Well, I don't I don't I don't really know that I Okay. Thank you. Dead Captain James says, I grew up in the rural South. We did lots of cockfighting in the 80s and 90s. And Santor's responding to that saying, 2021, bring it all back. Chickens ain't scared. I predict 2022 will be the next generation of to fully appreciate the sport. Okay, guys. This podcast has officially gone on way too long. We have we have turned it into something I never wanted it to become. Um <laughs> please do not. I am not condoning cockfighting. I'm not I'm not here to judge anyone who's ever participated in it. But I am not here to condone it or encourage it in any way. I was just here to say uh, games media is fucking dumb as shit because they can't let creatives just do shit in games. Like, obviously, like, I mean, have you ever played a game where, like, you do druggy time? Have you ever played a game where, like, you jump out of fucking building and then survive when you hit the ground? Games are supposed to be full of things you don't do and can't do in real life. So don't get judgmental when some cocks fight each other in Far Cry, okay? That's all I'm trying to say. Don't, don't go fighting some cocks, okay, Sam Torres? But thank you. Thank you for bringing your perspective. And Sam, it's always great to hear from you. Sam, please do me a favor. Don't fall off. Please, please don't stop commenting. Please don't stop listening to the show. Please, 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 Sam. Please don't go away. I love you, Sam. You're one of my favorite people to have comment in because when you comment, my heart skips a beat and that's probably something I should go see a doctor about. But thank you for being here. Now that's going to do it for all of our comments and whatnot from this week. Remember, for next week, don't be shy. Reply. Legitimately, don't be shy. Reply, you motherfuckers. Please also go over to iTunes. Rate the show five stars. Do rate it five stars. Please rate it five stars. Guys, help me grow the show. I'm doing the show every fucking Wednesday night, and you guys are just listening to it, not leaving five stars reviews on, on iTunes. You might be saying, Jesse, I have an Android device. How am I going to leave you a five-star review? I, don't, I never even eaten an Apple, much less bought one of their fucking products. And, and I'm going to say, listen, motherfucker, you got a library in your town? They might have a MacBook. Find a fucking MacBook. Leave me a goddamn five-star review. Otherwise, enjoy the show. I appreciate you being here. Hey, let's be totally cool and nonchalant and continue on with the show. I'm going to tell you all about what I've been playing this past week. But before I can tell you about that, I got to tell you all about what I've been eating. Guys, I'm going to leave out something negative because I don't want to be negative. I want to be positive Paul on this on this podcast this week. And so here I am to tell you that I got some great news for you. I, I And here's the thing is like I, I get it. I was just being funny and sarcastic or not funny. I was being goofy and sarcastic. Um, the funny part subjective. I'm often fun, uh, goofy on this podcast. I'm often joking on this podcast. I'm often trying to be a smart ass or a sarcastic little twat or whatever it is that I, I do. But this, I promise you, is genuine. It is coming from the bottom of my heart despite how it may come off sounding to you. Now, last week we talked about how it was possible that Disney pizza, the true blue Disney pizza that I know and love, the pizza that helped me fall in love with Walt Disney World just as much as Main Street USA and Space Mountain and Mission or Spaceship Earth and Ep 82 Epcon, all the shit about Disney that makes you fall in love with it. Just as much as all, as all those things have added to my affinity for Disney theme parks, Disney Pizza ranks among the top of that tier, top of that list. It's right up there with Carousel Progress and that smell that greets you when you walk into Disney's Pop Century Resort. It's right up there with riding the monorail and entering Walt Disney World property where all the highway signs turn to purple and red and all of a sudden you're in a magical place. It's right up there with, you know, the Tower of Terror and dining at Sci-Fi Dine-In Theater. It's all of that magical, just in fully embracing, fully enveloping world outside of any world you've ever experienced before. This is right up there with it. It is the Disney pizza. Is it gourmet? No. Is it the highest quality pizza you're ever going to have? Is it authentic Sicilian? Is it New York? Is it a New York slice, Jesse? You might be asking yourself. Is this one of those, is this one of those awesome Brooklyn $2 slices? Oh, it fills you up. It's two bucks. It's good. It's a real authentic New York experience. No, it's not that. This is pizza that is on, in terms of what kind of pizza it is. It's like frozen pizza. It's like fast food takeout pizza, you know? 
Think about that. But just because it is a lower grade pizza doesn't mean it's not special. And so I told you last week about this story, how Disney took away the Disney pizza. And I, I had the opportunity at one point to talk to one of the corporate chefs about this. And he talked about how they were trying a new pizza. It was literally twice the price. It sucked ass. It was homemade. It was terrible. I hated it. And he was like, you know, the old one we used to get was just a frozen pizza. We would just order and put in the thing. I, I don't care. It tasted good. And every time I bit into it, it reminded me of my favorite memories of visiting Disney World throughout my life. And I want it back. Well, despite the many things the Walt Disney Company gets right and wrong sometimes... This is something they absolutely got right. They brought it back. Now, is it 100% the same? No. I told you I was antsy about figuring out what was going on here. My girlfriend and I on Friday night went over to Disney's Riverside Resort, which just recently reopened. We wanted to say hi to this place we haven't been to in over a year. So we popped by there to just kind of explore the resort, say hi to Yeehaw Bob on the piano, see how things were going over there, walk around, explore this place, see how they've refurbished it since it was um, last open, and most importantly, to try out this new Disney pizza that they have going on at the resorts. It is $15 like it used to be. It looks the same as the old one when you order it in the app, and then you go into the food court to pick up your pizza, and what do you know? They serve it in the big white pizza box that has Mickey and all of his friends on the cover of it, just like the old pizzas used to have. You open it up, and you're met with that same waft that you once were. It smells just like it. Is it the same? No. It tastes like the whoever, whatever company they used to be buying it from changed the recipe. It's always been a dense, thick ass pizza, like like DiGiorno thick. I, I hate DiGiorno, but like it's like DiGiorno level thickness. Um, they thinned it a little bit to where it's still like you know like Domino's Pizza Hut level of thick pizza, like Papa John's thick pizza, um, but it's thinner than it once was. The other thing, and I think this is just the one we ordered, they clearly didn't cook it well enough. It was cooked well enough that like it wasn't like doughy, like the crust was. Fine, but like the cheese wasn't as melty as I would have liked and the crust wasn't as like golden as I would have liked so definitely got an undercooked pizza and when I posted the pictures online a lot of you were quick to point that out Jesse gross that looks like a cheap undercooked pizza shut up because this isn't about how they cooked my pizza it's about the fact that they brought the pizza back think of it like this let's say Pizza Hut is your favorite place to grab a fast food pizza right you love Pizza Hut so much and one day your friends like you guys want to order like Little Caesars or Domino's or Marco's Pizza or whatever? And you're like, no, fuck you. I hate Domino's. I like Pizza Hut. And your friend's like, well, the Pizza Hut by my house always gets the order wrong. Like it's always a little undercooked and I just feel like it's like old and stale and cold or whatever. And it's just, they don't make it right. But in your mind, you're like, listen, I like Pizza Hut so much that I will take poorly made Pizza Hut pizza over properly made Domino's pizza. I will take a cold, sitting out for an hour, undercooked Pizza Hut pizza over a properly, freshly baked, perfectly made, picturesque Domino's pizza because I just prefer that pizza more. And that's the point I'm trying to make here is, yes, did they make my pizza wrong a little bit? Yes, they did. But guess what? That's an easy problem to fix. I can go order it next time and get better luck. I can go to a different resort. There's over 25 resorts on Disney property. I can just go to any of the other resorts, order the same pizza, and the staff there probably makes it better. I don't know. That's not the thing here. Who gives a shit that they made it wrong that one time? I can just go order it again and get it made right. The thing is that what we're celebrating here is Disney pizza has returned. As I'm almost about to break my armrest for my keyboard. Disney pizza has returned, and that's what we're celebrating. We're not here to talk about whether they undercooked it by three minutes or not who gives a shit because it's the pizza i love it's the pizza i know and when i bit into that man i could have sworn it was 2015 going to disney world with my girlfriend for the first time all over again i thought i, I bit in that pizza and i thought oh my god save me a spot on main street on, on main street usa because the electrical parade's about to start any minute now i forgot all about the fact that the great movie ride had been torn down i forgot all about the fact that there was a COVID pandemic and we were wearing face masks at a theme park. Now, I forgot all about the fact that Disney just fired shit tons of people who were good, hardworking people who didn't deserve to lose their jobs, but they did it anyway because they wanted to save money in the middle of a pandemic and they can, they, they can get away with it. I forgot all about the fact that now I'm a jaded local who doesn't appreciate the parks the way I used to because I can just pop into Magic Kingdom anytime I want as opposed to having to save up and just dream about planning my next trip to come down. I forgot all about those things. And for one moment there, I was just a, a little boy eating my Disney pizza just the way I remembered it. So, guys, I just want to take this as a week. Let's First of all, moment of silence. Nothing died. I don't know why we're doing a moment of silence. But I just wanted to appreciate the fact that 
Despite the things Disney sometimes gets wrong, this past week they got something right. And they brought back one of the most important thing experiences, one of the most quintessential Disney experiences, and that is the Disney pizza. And I think we're all better off for it. Okay. That being said, I also tried Johnny Rocket for the first time. I've been trying to do Johnny Rockets for like, I feel like 10 years now. It's it's fine. It's good. I liked it for what it was. It's like slightly better steak and shake. I don't like that they give you a plate with ketchup on it, but they take the ketchup bottle and they make a little smiley face out of it, trying to be cute. I thought it was a death threat. I was very offended by it, and we left promptly. All right. Now, what I've been playing. So this week, I got some good news. I actually made some progress. I finally finished Psychonauts 2. And guys, I got to be honest. I don't, I'm don't. i not sure about favorite, but so far, Psychonauts, 3, Psychonauts 2 is definitely in the top three spaces for Game of the Year for me so far. I love this game. I think it is a vast improvement over the first game in almost all aspects. There are things about the first game I absolutely adore, like the Milkman level, but oh my god, by and large, Psychonauts 2 is just so visually beautiful to look at. It feels and controls so goddamn well. It's such a nice modern platform 3d platformer the the writing is so incredibly funny and charming and the story is just so incredibly endearing and cute it's it really is it's a really nice heartwarming story and i feel like we don't get enough games like this it's really really well done the game is so beyond me like how creative it is it's just so witty it's so creative the way it constantly like every level every enemy type every concept in the game is some spin-off of like some psychological condition or some like turbulence or, or emotional distraughtment in someone's life and it's about manifesting like our psychological turbulence in translating that into like gameplay features and it's just such an incredibly creative and fun game and i know that's kind of what the spirit of psychonauts has always been but man like double fine flexing that muscle in 2021 is a lot more impressive than them flexing that muscle in 2004 because where we are in the conversation surrounding mental health and all these things and just kind of the way they're able to use that modern nuance to apply to this game's creativity and gameplay mechanics it makes for a very very unique and special game and i just gotta say psychonauts 2 simply from a creativity and level design story perspective is just one of the most impressive games i've played in quite some time and then the gameplay is just fun as hell. I, I appreciate that it's a lot more linear than the first game. So it's it, it gets rid of a lot of the old school or archaic kind of design of like, where do I go next? What am I supposed to, how, how did I know I had to collect that or have this item before I could do this level? All of that's out the window. It's a lot more straightforward. Just like go here, this level. Now you're in this level. Back to the hub world. Go talk to this person. Now you're in that level. And it's very straightforward. Very fun. The pacing's great. And the game's a great length. It's like a 10 hour experience. It's just super fucking fun. I have nothing but great things to say about this game. If I had to give one criticism, I would say I'm not crazy about the combat. The combat isn't the most prominent aspect of the gameplay, um, but I do feel like the combat is a little like, not weak, but like whatever. I, I just wasn't, I was never really excited about the combat. I was more excited about the concept of what the enemies were and what they represented and the creative ways you uh, fight them and less so with the actual like fun of fighting the enemies. So I'll give that as my as my criticism, but I love the characters in this game. I love the story in this game. I love the creativity and just kind of the, the themes and the message of this game. It is a it's a very compelling game. I, I think you know this this year the games that stand to me the most that I played like brand new games um, are Shadow. What is it? Fucking Shadow Warrior. I already forgot the name of it. I didn't even beat the game, but goddamn, it was so fucking good. Cyber Shadow. Cyber Shadow and Psychonauts 2. Those are like the two games that stick out to me the most of all the new games I played this year that I'm just like, damn, that was a good game. But um, yeah, man, that's... I love it. I absolutely recommend that game. Could not recommend it more. What a great addition to Game Pass. Honestly, one of the very best values in your subscription. The other game I was playing this week, newer release, of course, we talked about last week. It's coming out. It's here, bitches. Back for Blood. I wish I could be as high on Back for Blood as I am on Psychonauts 2. In fact, I really truly thought Back for Blood was going to be in my top three games of the year this year. Because you'll remember, I've been saying for months now, like, how fucking crazy is it that here we are in the past 12 months, we basically just like, like, cucked out to my childhood Xbox 360 nostalgia with like, with like the games I used to play religiously being like Call of Duty World at War with the original zombies, Left 4 Dead 1, one of my favorite co-op games to play with buddies, and Halo 3. And then it's like, here we are, this fall 2020, 2020 to fall 2021 
time period is just like Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. It's basically just like bringing you back to your favorite era of Call of Duty. And Back for Blood, it's basically just more Left for Dead. And Halo Infinite, it's basically like a proper, in all aspects, like direct sequel to Halo 3. It's like, whoa. Like Xbox Series X just quickly became like adult Xbox 360 for me. Like it's fucking awesome. And I've been looking forward to this so much, but for as great as the Halo Infinite betas have been so far and as promising as that game looks, and for as much fun and uh, enjoyment I've gotten out of Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, I don't feel like Back for Blood holds up its um, recapturing of the Left 4 Dead spirit the way I hoped it would, the way these other games have recaptured my love for their respective franchises and that maybe that's not a really fair comparison to even make to begin with but i can't help but draw that comparison when it's like you know call of duty has been not my thing for so long and now all of a sudden it's like they made a call of duty that speaks to me left for dead has been absent for over a decade and now boom left for dead's back you know halo i love halo 4 and 5 so much but halo suddenly went from like being this new thing that 343 envisioned to like exactly the nostalgia you have from 2007. Here we go. It's Halo 3 all over again. And it's like the fact that like we're just going back to the well. We're just going back to like my 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 embryonic childhood love for these respective franchises just had me so giddy with expectation and, and excitement for these games. And oh man, I'm, I'm very disappointed to say Back for Blood does not hold up. Sorry, it, do, it doesn't make good on its promise. Because let's be honest, everything from the name of the game to the enemy types in the game to just the way the game is formatted in place, obviously there's no shying around this. This is supposed to be Left 4 Dead 3. This is basically Turok saying, hey, we want to make Left 4 Dead 3. We don't own this franchise anymore. It belongs with Valve. They're never going to make Left 4 Dead 3. So fuck it. We'll make Left 4 Dead 3. There's no denying that's exactly what Back 4 Blood is. I love it. But Back 4 Blood... I it, it misses the simplicity of Left 4 Dead. It just, it completely forgets it. Because the thing that was so great about Left 4 Dead is, and, I, and maybe this is controversial, I'm a Left 4 Dead 1 fan. I think Left 4 Dead 2 is phenomenal. I love both of them. But I prefer Left 4 Dead 1, actually. I love the simplicity of, like, here are four campaigns. They each take, like, 30 to 45 minutes to beat. And they are all equal in length. And they are all equal in, like, value. It's just basically what kind of setting or setup do you want. They're all based on, like, typical tropey horror movie setups, right? There's the one in the woods. There's the one in the abandoned downtown. There's the one that's, like, a crash plane. I love it. And it's just, like, you pick up, do you want the assault rifle or do you want the shotgun? Do you want pills or do you want the health pack? Do you want the pipe bomb or do you want the, the Molotov? And it's just very, like, A, B kind of binary choices with your with your loadout. And it's just very, like, everyone starts from the same place. No matter what character you pick, they're all equal. And it's just as simple as you pick it up, you pick the character, and you play the fucking game, and you have fun. And it's really fun on, all by yourself. And it's really fun with just one other friend. And it's really fun with three other friends to make it a full four-player co-op experience. No matter how you approach this game... It's pick up and play. It's easy to understand. It's fun as shit. And that was the beauty of, of Left 4 Dead. It was so simple. It was so... there Because I remember the first time I played Left 4 Dead. I remember being so confused by it. Because I was like, I've never played a game like this. And I, I just... I still to this day distinctively remember the very first time I played Left 4 Dead. I've been looking forward to playing that game forever. It came out fall of 2008. I got it around my birthday, spring of 2009. So a couple months after the game came out, I remember bringing it home from GameStop, super fucking excited to play this game. And then like 30 minutes into it, I was like, so this is the game? Like, it's just, there's no cutscenes, there's no story, there's no, you just like pick the character and play the game. And then like, I remember being my first campaign, like, oh, okay, so that's it. And then I can play the other one or I can go back and play this again. And I remember like, it just kind of clicked with me after that first night with the game, it just clicked with me. I'm like... This is unlike any experience I've ever had in a game. And it's just so fun. Like the thing, the beauty of, of, of Left 4 Dead is it it kind of instantly drives its replayability home to the player the way that like a 25 cent arcade machine does, you know? Like you think about, think about a game like Galaga. We're just talking about Mr. Ono who just passed away. You know, like a game like Gal Galaga is so simple. You put the quarter in, you're on the spaceship, you move left and right and you shoot. You just shoot, you shoot, you shoot, you move and you dodge uh, enemies and you shoot, okay? Simple as can fucking be. And then you die and it's like game over, insert another quarter. You're like, that's it? That's it? Okay, all right. 
another quarter. Let's try it again. And it's just fun because it's endlessly repeatable and fun to do again and again and again. And that's the beauty of Left 4 Dead. Back 4 Blood completely fucking misses this by all measurements. It's like, here's a hub world. You got to load into this hub world. Which character do you want to play as? Mind you, they're all completely different. They all have different stats and skills and loadouts. And here's like... 85 million fucking weapons for you to choose from. And on top of all of that, which is pretty easy to get over, right? It's not too big a deal. On top of all of that, the menu system is completely fucking broken because where you go to select a level is different from where you go for like training slash card deck building, which is all, all equally looks the same in this fucking unnecessary hub world when you could just have a start menu. And... And then on top of all of that, this is the real kicker. The fucking card system, man. The card system sucks ass. Now, the good thing is you can mostly just ignore it and, like, just, eh, I don't know, get out of my way, click a card, go, go, go. But it's like, I don't want the game to have these cumbersome added elements that I don't care about and I'm just blowing off. Like, I want to understand the game. The, the beauty of Left 4 Dead was, like, you understand the totality of the game instantly the moment you pick it up because it's just about shooting zombies and getting from point A to point B and having fun doing it. And Back 4 Blood is like, well, this one gives me a 10% increased buff on healing. And this one, oh, which gun should I choose and which attachment do I need for my weapon? And it's like, no, it's stupid. And then on top of that, Back 4 Blood sucks because... The difficulty is fucking completely broken. So, Left 4 Dead had four difficulty modes. Back 4 Blood only has three. So, they got rid of the easiest modes, just normal, hard, and very hard, instead of easy, normal, hard, and very hard. And that's, like, fine, whatever, okay. But the problem is, the way that the special infected, which are mostly like Left 4 Dead special infected, the way that they work, though, the way that they're balanced and tooled in this game is in such a way that, like, you cannot play this game by yourself. You can try. The game will let you play by yourself. It sucks. It fucking sucks. It's way too hard. This game absolutely demands you play it with at least one or two friends. You have to play it cooperatively. You cannot just like do... And, and don't get me wrong. Left 4 Dead's like that, right? In classic Left 4 Dead, you can't just run 20 yards ahead of your team and be like, bye fuckers because a smoker's going to grab you and then someone's going to have to come save your ass. That's in the spirit of Left 4 Dead. But this is different this is like this guy can't go over here and take on this enemy because he's going to be overpowered so three guys got to take on this enemy and this person can't be over here setting up this trap because everyone's got to be focused on this one objective at a time it's the kind of cooperativeness that's not like i need to be with my team and help them out in case i get in trouble it's the kind of cooperativeness that's like we're not going to get past this if we don't work together left 4 dead only had that issue which isn't an issue it's a feature if you played on hard difficulties because it was like that's what the hard difficulty is for it's for players that want that extreme cooperative experience but the easier difficulties were for people who just want to run and gun and shoot fucking zombies and play with their heads turned off you know just brain shut off play shoot zombie back for blood just doesn't let you do that it's way too involved it's way too cooperative to focus to the point where if you're gonna play by yourself or you're gonna play with randos and no headsets you're not gonna have a good time you were just not going to have a good time and and we played it on i've mo almost exclusively played this on stream we've pl i played with other people and so i've been fortunate enough to not really have that experience too much but man it's just not not left for dead it's just way too convoluted, way too complicated, way too many skills, way too many things. These like random boss encounters that don't need to be there. So many of the things where it's like, do I need to kill this zombie? Or do I need to run from this zombie? Or do I like what? I don't like it. And, and let me, let me give it some credit. I like its modern sensibilities. I like that it has aim down sights. I like that it has run. The visuals are great. The game looks fantastic. Once you get more into the game, it has some really nice locations and varied places to explore. I like that there's a lot of creative, like, oh, you're at the end of this this part of the campaign, so like you have to do this objective. And it's like a lot of like cool stuff. It's not just like call the horde, defend it until rescue arrives. It's like, okay, get two guys on the turret here while these guys run and retrieve this item. So it's like cool shit like that. Again, it plays into the cooperative nature, which makes it really bad for single player. But when you are playing with others, it is pretty cool to have to pull off this cooperative feat together. So there are moments of excitingness and there are, and don't get me wrong, I'm having fun with this game, but I just know that from what I'm experiencing with Back for Blood, this is a game where I want to experience all the content this game has to offer one time. And then I want to uninstall it and be done with it. And then when I have the itch, I'll play Left 4 Dead on Steam. And that sucks. I wanted Back for Blood to be like, all right, guys, step aside, Left 4 Dead 2. Time to put you out to pasture because we finally have a new Left 4 Dead game. But that's, that's just not what this is for me. So I don't know. I mean, the other thing is like the, the acts are so fucking broken. Like there's continues and stuff. So it's like, oh, you've died too many times in this campaign. You can't respawn. You have to restart from this point. And like Act 1 is like seven chapters long. And then Act 2 is like one chapter long. And then Campaign 2 is like 
half the length of campaign one. It's just completely fucking out of whack and broken. The pacing is off. It just, everything's locked from the get. So you have to play through it in order to unlock it. You can't just pop in and play whatever you want, whenever you want. It just takes away all the replay value, the arcadey fun, the pick up and play, the easy to understand nature of it. And I get that it's all based around, well, we have this card system. We have this monetization system. We're going to have battle passes and try to make money off the game down the road. And I feel like all of that is completely detrimental to the core experience of Left 4 Dead. And the game is just sorely lacking as a result. So is Back for Blood a bad game? No. In fact, it's a good game. It's If you're not looking at this as it has to be the next Left 4 Dead game, if you're just looking at this as like a fun co-op zombie shooter with friends, it's a pretty good time. It's a pretty fun game. It's a well-polished, well-put-together, mostly fun adventure. If you're looking at this as like, I want to recapture that same magic I had on Left 4 Dead 10 years ago, this is not it. It just, it feels like, and the frustrating thing is in so many ways it looks and feels like Left 4 Dead, but in all the ways that it really counts, it drops the ball. And maybe that's a controversial take. Maybe that's a unique take. I feel like a lot more people are higher on this game than I am. But again, I'm, I, I don't hate it. In fact, I do like it. I just, I'm just let down by it. I just, I had higher expectations, I guess is what I'm saying. And it's not, to, I'm usually not one to overhype things. I'm not usually let down by games. Usually like if, if a game, I, I know what kind of games I like. Usually like, if a game looks like a Jesse game, I know it's a Jesse game and I enjoy it for what it is because I'm usually pretty good at setting my expectations right depending on the game. Back for Blood was one of those ones where I definitely had the wrong expectations and I was definitely let down as a result. So, I don't know. That's what I've been playing. Also, I've been playing some more Metroid Dread, but that's Nintendo. We won't get into that. Guys, we're like an hour and 40 minutes in. Let's jump into the proper news of which we still have a lot more shit to get to. It's a big week, so stay tuned for that. All right, so we got a good chunk of news here. Let's just jump right into our first story. You know. Remember Xbox's Compulsion Games, the, t the team behind uh, We Happy Few? Yeah, never talked about, but here we finally have an update from these guys. So, as reported from VGC, Xbox's Compulsion Games, the developer behind We Happy Few, has revealed that the next title that they're working on will be a third-person narrative single-player game. Very interesting, because the last game they built was not for focused on narrative first, it was first person, not third person. So this is all different for them. In an interview with Xbox Squad, Nyla, I mean, I'm butchering this, Nyla Hodges uh, from Compulsion Game talked about the studio's expansion. Its plans for the future revealed a few details about its next unannounced title. In the interview, which began, in the interview translated from French, Hodges discussed the studio's next game, stating, quote, I think we gave ourselves a little time to learn. It's our first game with Microsoft and we're learning a lot. Compulsion Games were acquired by Microsoft back in 2018 as part of a massive acquisition that included Ninja Theory Playground Games and Undead Labs, all of which we've heard from since their acquisition, just not Compulsion. Hodges also revealed that the size of the team had greatly expanded since we last heard from them, saying we've, we've doubled the workforce and are adapting to it. He also notes that the goal is to expand our zany universe and to continue to make our mark in video games as a studio that likes to make unique games. In little use said Settings. For now, that's our goal. Pursue our legacy, our heritage, while remaining true to ourselves. The new project, which is said to have started production only a few months after the release of We Happy Few, is currently in what Hodges calls full development. He also revealed that unlike We Happy Few, the next project is unlikely to debut in early access due to its narrative nature, saying, quote, with our new game, the narrative the third person, sorry, a narrative third person story game, I don't think we need any feedback. It's not like a roguelike where you replay it multiple times and you need data to make sure that the experience is fun. We Happy Few has evolved a lot in the, its beginning. It was a roguelike type game with that added story at one point because people loved the world so much, the characters and the, the they, and Compulsion said, okay, we're going to make a game with an end and a story. The next game is a story. We know where we are going with it. When asked what he, sorry, she, I don't know why I had he, I had it written wrong in the earlier notes. When asked what she thinks, when she thinks we'll see the game, she responded with, I have no idea. Some of this is like quirky a little bit because the French trans, the translation from French adds some quirkiness to the way it's written. And I don't know if that's things we can be looking into or if that's just a translation bump, right? So the first thing I think I mean by that is this quote here at the beginning where it says, where she says, Actually, a second quote. Where is it? Yeah. We've doubled our workforce and, our, our, and we are adapting to it. The goal is to expand our zany universe and to continue to make our mark in video games as a studio. Okay. Yeah. To make unique games in little used settings. Okay. So, like, 
Is this a reference to the team itself growing, or is this in reference to the world that they're going to work on is going to be based on this We Happy Few world? I couldn't tell if they meant adapting to and expanding their zany universe being like the staff that works at Compulsion Games or the universe they built when they introduced We Happy Few. My guess is they're talking to about the staff, but that was the first thing I was like, wait, what? But the other thing is just like, okay, so We Happy Few came out, man. So the game came out in early access in 2016 and was officially released in 2018 with like the, the full version of it. So technically it's only been three years since We Happy Few. So it's like, oh, okay, we haven't seen your next project. That's not too crazy. And you guys have been growing and expanding, trying to figure out what's next. Okay, that's fine. But in some fashion, this game's been out since 2016. So it feels almost like, damn, five years and nothing from these guys. These... And so, I mean, maybe that's just, you know, one of the one of the downsides to doing an early access thing is it just makes it seem like you're working on this one game forever, and then it's just so long until we find out what you're doing next. But, man, with Compulsion, it just seems like they're just up to nothing. And, yes, this is good to have this update. It's good to know, okay, hey, we exist. We're alive. We're breathing. We're working on a video game, believe it or not. This is nice. I do appreciate this story happening and this update happening, but... Man, like, I am, don't get me wrong, I'm mostly excited for what 343 is doing. I don't give a shit who Xbox buys. I don't care if they buy, like, if they resurrect Gandhi's corpse and make him a video game developer. I will never be as excited about anything happening on Xbox uh, as, as I am with whatever the fuck 343 is working on at any given time. So, there's the hierarchy of what I care about, but... Even though Compulsion hasn't put out a game I give a shit about, and even though Compulsion is a team I think has a lot to prove and is probably the biggest weakling of the Xbox first-party roster and lineup, I have a lot of enthusiasm for what these guys can become, and I have a lot of curiosity to know more about what their next project is, which is why I bring them up in examples all the time. And so it's really cool to know, you know, it sounds promising. They're working on a narrative driven story experience yes because that's kind of how they that's that's kind of how they introduced we happy few and then we happy few ended up being not very story driven and kind of not fun at all for people like me and so if they're making like a third person story narrative driven game like oh fuck yeah i want a game like that not roguelike it's a point a to point b like you you play the game from start to finish i want that maybe not like linear a to b that's I don't mean to insinuate, but, you know, God, like, I just, I want, I want a game I can pick up and, and like, like Psychonauts, I, I picked up the game, I started it, I played through it, and I beat it. I, I want that so badly. I feel like that's kind of what I've been waiting to see from these guys. So it sounds like they're going in the right direction just in terms of what they're working on next. But the question is, like, what is that? What does that look like? What does that play like? Now that you have AAA money, you have Daddy's Wallet, now that you have twice the team now that you have all the access and and uh all the tools at your disposal that are afforded with being on on xbox what are we going to do with that and so this is a nice little step in the right direction this is a little bit of progress right but man oh man oh man it's just like you don't even know when i don't know i guess it's not that crazy to think they don't know when we're going to see the game but that definitely doesn't leave me optimistic that we're going to learn anything by E3. You know, if like, I, don't, I don't fucking know. You know, I feel like they'd be like, oh, you know, probably some sometime in the next year or so. You know, if that was the response, I'd be like, okay, cool. We're going to learn about this. But the fact that they're like, when do you think we'll see the game? And she's just like, oh, I have no idea. It's like, oof. That just, I don't know. That makes me feel like we're in a situation that we're in with Rare where it's like, okay, it might be another couple of years. <laughs> so, I don't know. It's just good to get this update. I'm curious um, if what they're going to work on next is going to try to build off that We Happy Few universe. I feel like they might. I forget, What's the name of their first game they did? Uh, Contrast, that game they did in 2013. I feel like they kind of used that art style, that like dark, like Bioshock meets Tim Burton kind of art style, that like French-Canadian weird twisted noir look that they do. Like I feel like that's that's kind of their thing. And I feel like what they built with We Happy Few was like a setting in a world that people were interested in. And if they can take that and build a cool game, like a story-driven narrative adventure out of that, I feel like they might have a winner on their hands. So I think there's a possibility we see maybe not directly associated 
with We Happy Few, but something in that vein, something in that universe, I feel like that might be a natural place for them to go. Um, although you never know, this could be something entirely different, uh, entirely unrelated, completely different setting. Maybe we're setting ourselves up for another space adventure. I don't, I don't fucking know, but nonetheless, I'm just really happy that we're getting some kind of update from compulsion. Um, because I guess the way my, my thing is, it's like every team that Xbox owns right now, it's like they have an identity, you know, in exile, they haven't put out a triple a first party Xbox exclusive title yet. Now that they're now that the first party, they haven't done it right. Neither has neither has uh, you know Double Fine. Neither has most of these teams. We haven't seen anything like, like in. They haven't done anything like that. So so many of these teams. We haven't seen the big AAA. We got Daddy's wallet. Here's our full effort trying to make an Xbox exclusive title, next gen, AAA, all that. We haven't seen that from all these guys. But I feel like all these teams already have an established identity. Compulsion Games is the one developer I'm like, I'm not convinced you have an established identity. You know, unlike Ninja Theory, unlike Playground, unlike and Undead Labs, unlike, you know, The Initiative and Compulsion are the two studios where I'm like, I don't know what to expect from those two teams. And at this point, it's just like, you know, The Initiative, we do know what to expect more. Um, so I, I don't know. I guess that's kind of why I'm so curious about what they're up to, but... You know, it, it seems like since since We Happy Few has been completely, like, properly released and out, it's only been, like, three, three and a half years. So, all right, I'll give them that. But, man, sooner or later, I, I, want, I want to see what these guys are up to. All right, next up, VGC also reports that Xbox Game Pass has attracted fewer new subscribers this last year than Microsoft had originally targeted. According to a financial document filed by Microsoft last week they sp and spotted by Axios, the number of Game Pass... Impossible. The number of Game Pass subscribers grew by 37.48% during the past 12 months, ending on June 30th. The company had targeted a 47.79% increase, meaning that they missed their target by almost by over a full 10%. In Microsoft's previous fiscal year ending on June 30, 2020, Game Pass subscribers grew by 85.75%, outperforming the company's goal of 71%. The subscriber growth target is one of several performance goals tied to the Microsoft's exec's stock compensation for competitive reasons. Microsoft's filing reads, target targets and results are expressed in terms of year-over-year -year growth rather than actual subscriber numbers. Game Pass launched in June of 2017, of course, and became essential to Microsoft's gaming business, attracting over 18 million subs as of January of this year. According to the latest publicly announced figures, the service offers offers members access to over 100 titles, including the first party games launched for only 10 bucks or 15 bucks a month, depending on the tier you get. We all know how this goes. In their earnings call this past July, Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, claimed that Game Pass was growing rapidly with subscribers playing a pro playing approximately 40% more games and spending 50% more than non-members. Now, of course, we know the subscriber count is like 24 million based on what, uh, who wrote in said that last week? I'm sorry. Anyway, the uh, the thing, the, the big thing I want to take away here, and some, someone noted this on Twitter, I forget who, I'm sorry for not, I think it may have been Benji Sales. This original target goal of increasing by 47.79%, was originally made when the idea was Halo Infinite would be launched in fall of 2020. So that target goal was with Halo Infinite being on the market in mind, meaning obviously they would get a huge influx of subscribers because people want to get Halo Infinite. So the fact that they only hit 37 instead of 47%, it didn't have Halo, in fact, didn't have any massive major first party only whatever i mean they had mlb the show and outriders and shit like that and marvel's avengers doesn't count because this is this ended june 30th um so i mean they've had huge gets don't get me wrong i'm not trying to cut them too much slack but they didn't have halo infinite or anything like that um happen with game pass so they they did miss that huge white whale kind of uh, uh game that would have just boosted uh, subscriber numbers like crazy. So that's the first thing I want to mention. The other thing I want to mention is, now that that's the giving Microsoft the benefit of the doubt. Here's the scarier number if you want to look at it on the other perspective, which is generally Microsoft sets pretty conservative goals because they like to exceed expectations like any company would, uh, just because this makes things look very, very promising for investors. So this is very common where you see Microsoft 
They smashed revenue goals for fiscal quarter. They smashed subscriber numbers for Office 365. They smashed surface revenue, blah, 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 blah. They always like to set their goals a little lower than what they actually think they're going to do so that it makes their numbers look really good to investors when it's like, oh, yeah, look, we, we beat our expectation by 5%, by 10%, whatever. So the fact that they missed their expectation by 10%, by 10 percentage points, well, not by 10%, by 10 points off of what they expected. That That's rough. That's really fucking rough. Uh, because that is a massive gap. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're expecting on like, like legit industry analysts to, and number crunchers and things like that to help you get a really accurate number, a soft number that you can easily attain, and then you're off by that much, that's not good. So is Game Pass okay? Yes. Is Game Pass doing very, very well? Yes. But Game Pass failed to meet their internal expectation and knowing Microsoft, they usually set it a little lower than what they actually believe. And so that is not a good sign if you look at it that way. So I do just want to point that out. Now, keep in mind, Xbox Series X is a console that came out in November and still to this day has yet to have a big AAA console exclusive. Gotta buy the Xbox for this game. Still doesn't have it. All the big games that have come out this year have been on previous generations of hardware. They also work on your Xbox One. They also are on PS4 and PS5 and PC. So there haven't been like that many reasons other than just like people want new shit for people to be like, oh, I got to subscribe to Game Pass. got to buy a new Xbox. Got to do that. And the bigger thing, just because there's less of a correlation between like selling the new Xbox and getting people to subscribe to Game Pass. The other thing I want to mention is last year, there was a global pandemic and everyone was at home and everyone was subscribing to Game Pass because they needed things to keep themselves busy. Right now, what we're seeing is, you know, gaming revenue is going to be long term up from where it was pre pandemic, but it's not going to be as high as it was during the peak of the pandemic, because guess what? A lot of people are back to work now. A lot of people are vaccinated and comfortable with going out and doing shit again. So that need to stay home, be on Game Pass, play all the latest games, buy all the latest games, just game, 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 because you got to entertain yourself from home. That's coming to a close for a lot of people. And so there are probably a lot of people who are like, eh, I don't need Game Pass anymore. You know, I had it last year during COVID. It was great. Now I'm not working from home anymore. And now I'm out and about. I'm going out on Friday nights and Saturday nights. I'm going back to the club. I'll be wearing cologne and shaking my tail feathers. So, you know, there's people out there like that. And maybe some of those people are like, well, Game Pass hasn't gotten a huge game in a while. So I stopped subscribing because, you know, I go out now. There's no big game pulling me in. And so there's a lot of factors at play here. I, I would say that this one is not that devastating because people kind of returning to normalcy after COVID and because Halo wasn't included in these numbers like it was initially supposed to be, I'll say you can give this one a pass. But if next year, you know, they, they're that off again, you know, maybe they set their, their expectations a little more conservative so they don't run the risk of doing this again. But if they have a similar goal or expectation of mine and they're off by that much again, you know, maybe then it's like, oof, that's not great. But still, keep in perspective, Game Pass is doing absurdly well. Game Pass is doing very, very well. It is still growing. It's still growing fast. People are still getting on that train. I don't think there's any cause for serious concern here, but just some things you want to think about and keep in the back of your mind. So that's the fun thing about that story. Now, next up, VGC reports. Ubisoft has greenlit what will be its first mainline Splinter Cell game in a decade. That's according to a development source who told VGC that the title has been into production as has been put into production as a means of winning back frustrated fans by recent efforts to revive the franchise in mobile and VR spaces. It's not clear whether the studio is working on the project through though two people or sorry it's not clear which studio is working on the project, though two people with knowledge on Ubisoft's plans suggest that the new Splinter Cell was being led by a studio outside the traditional Montreal base. The title is in an early phase of production, and, the, and sources uh, say that there is a small chance that it could be announced next year. The much-requested sequel will arrive at a time when the company is looking to rebuild its image. Ubisoft has declined to comment on the when approached ahead of the publication from VGC, Splinter Cell is a series stealth game published by under the Tom Clancy label. The game stars Sam Fisher, a Black Ops agent working on Government Division, the third echelon. The most recent title was 2013's Splinter Cell Blacklist, and it's been eight years since that game released, without a new entry since it first debuted, you know, back in 02 on the OG Xbox. Now, Ubisoft 
has already announced a new Splinter Cell project last year, but many fans were left disappointed because it's a VR game. It partnered with Facebook, so literally put your finger in the back of your throat and gag. Ubisoft Yves Guillemont has said that the key factor in the wait for a new Splinter Cell game has come at the success of Ubisoft franchises like Assassin's Creed and The Division and Watch Dogs, saying that these games sold really well and developers have been keen to work on these fresher properties. Also, because Assassin's Creed and all other brands taken off, people want to work on those brands more, so we had to follow what the developers want to do. I call it bullshit on this. You see, the thing is, Ubisoft has transitioned a lot since the last time Splinter Cell happened. Because last time we got Splinter Cell was around the time Far Cry 3 happened and blew up. And it was around that 2012, 2013 time period where Ubisoft's like, oh, okay, okay. We're doubling down on this like checkbox map open world game thing. Everyone's like, everything's like Far Cry now. And then Assassin's Creed started turning into that. And Far Cry doubled and tripled down on what it was. And Vision happened. And then they turned Ghost Recon into basically a Far Cry game and everything like that. And then we got, that kind of brought us to like the Ubisoft we've known as of late. And then even more recently, we've seen Ubisoft be like, okay, now everything's a game as a service. You got Rainbow Six Siege and Hyperscape and this new Ghost Recon game that's supposed to be like a Battle Royale and all this shit. They're just trying to try this, uh, what is it? Defiance X or whatever, X Defiant or whatever, this new sh competitive free-to-play shooter thing they're doing. They're trying to get into that, like, games as a service, battle royale, whatever kind of money, hungry, grabbing, whatever thing, and it's not working. And what we're seeing is Ubisoft is just getting more and more shit from their, from their audience saying, why do you keep making these games no one's asking for? Why do you keep giving us these games no one wants to play? Why do you keep bastardizing these franchises we used to? love so much why is this what this has become you know why is assassin's creed now a social space online world as a game as a service game why is ghost recon literally nothing like ghost recon why is everything pretending to be far cry why is far cry's formula not changed one fucking bit in a decade at this point point? and this these are the questions people are starting to ask people are starting to get really frustrated with ubisoft and so it seems to me especially because there's just so much frustration at like dude Everyone loves Splinter Cell. Make a fucking Splinter Cell game. I think this is their way of saying, okay, at this point, our big issue is an image issue. We need to get people to not hate us because Ubisoft was kind of always the big publisher that people kind of respected, you know, compared to like Activision and EA. And so this is bad for them. It's really important that they protect that brand of like, hey, we're the big corporate, big name public video game publisher that you actually like. And so I think maintaining that image is 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 priceless and absolutely paramount for them. And so it seems like what they're prepared to do here is basically just be like, fuck it, we're, we we got to put together a, 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 a Splinter Cell game. And they're prepared to basically just announce a game that they're just in early pre-production just greenlit the idea for it but have no concept for what the game is nothing to show basically they're prepared to announce this game the way ea announces their games with the developer sitting in front of a computer monitor and the computer monitor has like a single piece of concept art in the background and they're just like we love splinter cell and we're really excited to announce that we're working on more splinter cell please look forward to this game in like six to ten years please and thank you and that's not great, you know, that's that's basically them just being like, how can we stop the hemorrhaging of, of our brand identity here? And they're like, uh, an announce, a, announce a Splinter Cell game, right? And now they got to figure out, because if this is true, that the reason why they stepped away from Splinter Cell is because they feel like the game needs to evolve and change fundamentally so that they can give you a good reason to come back to a game that's otherwise become kind of dated in terms of its gameplay, which I don't believe, then they got a bigger problem here because now they're greenlining a game they don't have a solution to their so-called problem for yet, you know? So that's that's the other aspect here. Um, I I think I think the bigger problem here is that Splinter Cell is a very linear, one and done, story driven, single player experience, and they want Splinter Cell to be something that is more mainstream palatable, open world, checkbox, games as a service, co op multiplayer, open world multiplayer, whatever, because those are the games that sell six, eight, ten, twelve million copies. As opposed to games like Splinter Cell, which get a lot of critical like a lot of critical praise, a lot of hardcore gamer praise, but when it really boils down to things, it's like oh, stealth action. You know, that's kind of a niche genre. So they're probably thinking, you know, why are we going to invest all this talent and time into a franchise that's going to sell like two, three, four million copies when we could make the game that's going to sell like eight, ten, twelve million copies? And I think that has everything to do with why we haven't seen. Splinter Cell in all this time 
but they're getting to the point where they're like, you know, we're just going to have to green light this because we need to protect our identity, protect our brand. And at that point, you know, that's kind of the goal for them. And that's just how I'm reading into this. But man, it's just um, something's happening at Ubisoft. They are really slipping. They're really dropping the ball. And you just got to think in a world where they're making Ghost Recon, a battle royale kind of tactical game in a world where Far Cry is the same fucking game right now that it was 10 years ago. No change for better or for worse. And in a world where Assassin's Creed went from basically Prince of Persia to like fucking, I don't know what they're trying to make it into, like Final Fantasy 14 or some shit like that. You got to ask yourself, like, do we want this iteration of Ubisoft approaching Splinter Cell? If you're someone who wants Splinter Cell, do you want the Splinter Cell that's going to be like an open world tactical... Uh, espionage I, I don't know I guess you could try to make the splinter cell that's like Metal Gear Solid 5 if you want maybe that would be in the spirit of modern um, Ubisoft but at the same time I'm like man if if the, if we're going to do the splinter cell what you're doing to all your other properties you're not doing your fans a favor you're just going to set yourself up for more torment down the road so you got to you got to think about that look at look at Ubisoft's track record recently do you really want them making a splinter cell right now all right. All right. Next up, VGC. I told you, they're, they're our source this week. They just got all the shit. I love this, this site. Electronic Arts is creating a new studio focused on first-person shooter games and with one of Halo's co-creators on board. Marcus Leto, who co-created the Halo franchise at Bungie and performed both art direction and creative direction role, sorry, and creative director, director roles, announced via Twitter that he's joining a startup. He's he's joining this, a startup developer as a game director, saying, hey, everyone, I'm excited to announce that I've joined EA as game director, building a new studio in the Seattle area and working on first-person games. Can't wait to share more information with what we're creating. Leto was one of the founding members of the Halo franchise, having served as art director on the first three installments and creative director for Reach. He previously created Private, Div created Private Division publisher shooter Disintegration, which ultimately failed to resonate with an audience and led to the closure of Leto's studio, V1 Interactive. Their only game they ever made came out last summer. I played it. Leto had previously suggested that the next career move would be a div diverse among some consumer. Sorry. Leto had previously suggested that his next career move would be divisive among some consumers, saying some of you will support it, some will not. I just ask that you will join me in the next, next leg of my journey. The new EA studio is seemingly going to be uh, its second new developer open in Seattle, uh, at, shortly following news that former Monolith Productions head Kevin Stevens formed another which will be focused on the development of an open world action adventure game although that seemingly has nothing to do with this one just coincidentally same area the new unnamed EA studio will be based in Seattle but may also support remote working opportunities this is exciting because we're seeing EA really start to expand rapidly and it's kind of disappointing to an extent because it's like ea shut down pandemic they were great ea shut down visceral they were great <laughs> it's like ea shut down a lot of good studios in recent history um that didn't need to be disbanded that didn't need to be shut down and now it especially feels like it was all for naught because now they're opening all these studios and it's like well what was the point of like just you know just shuttering a bunch of devs for a couple of years to slim up only for you to go back and make a bunch of new studios because Respawn Entertainment has a second studio and then Vince Sampella is heading up that other new studio. So he's working with like three studios now. You got uh, Stevens, uh, well, sorry, what's his name? Kevin Stevens um, from Monolith and then Marcus Leto uh, from V1 Interactive and Bungie formerly now starting two new studios in Seattle, which are apparently unrelated to one another. And it's like, EA, you're just you're just opening up all these new studios, and these are like studio studios, not like support teams for the most part. And so I can't help but wonder, like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, what happened between like 2017 and 2021 that you're just like, yeah, 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 we need to like, shut all these studios down and then take a break for a second and then open a bunch of new studios? It just seems like a whole lot of unnecessary hiring and firing and forming and tearing down, whatever. But that being said, congrats to Marcus Leto. This guy is an absolute legend. 
Um, I played his game Disintegration that came from V1 Interactive. Now, I feel like the story of that game isn't ever properly conveyed. That was a small team he made of like 30, literally like 30 people. And it was all like young developers, like graduate students and like upcoming developers. And he was, it was basically like his class of students that he was like shepherding. And they were basically making this game that got picked up by Private Division to be published. But it was a very like double A, like first attempt at something with this like one veteran heading up the project but a bunch of very young fresh talent and i thought the game you know i thought the game was fun for what it for what it was i enjoyed it quite a bit i thought it was very unique it was like fps meets like tactical meets like aerial combat it was just kind of a weird interesting concept for a game i thought it was very fun it wasn't the most polished it wasn't the most like mechanically uh, addicting game I've ever played, but it was very unique and cool for what it was. And it's, uh, it's really quite a shame that that game just kind of came out, flopped so fucking hard. And then the team disbanded almost immediately because you know, someone like Marcus Leto, he'll be okay. He'll bounce to the next project. All those other developers that worked with him though. That's so sad. Those guys are probably, you know, that, that for a lot of those people that may be their one and only time in the games industry. So it's really rough the way that had to play out. Um, but it's great to see him getting back to work, getting back to forming a new studio, leading a new studio, and with EA backing it with that kind of money and presumably the kind of access to talent he's going to have, especially being in Seattle. Woo! Watch out. We're going to have the, the, the Bungies and the 343 guys. He's going to be able to poach a lot of his old talent from, from, from his Halo days, possibly, um, working in Seattle. So this is going to be a really interesting studio to keep your eye out on. Especially once you consider, you know, EA. Think about first-person shooters in EA. They have DICE, the guys that just do Battlefield and Battlefront. And then they got Respawn, the guys that do Apex Legends and Titanfall, but Titanfall's dead. And now they got these guys. It's like, okay, you're also first-person shooter? What are you guys going to be working on? It would be so fucking cool if these guys took on Titanfall 3 since Respawn's not doing it. Oh my god, I'd fucking love it. You know, we could, that, that'd be really interesting to see what they could do with the Titanfall franchise. But at the same time, I can't help but wonder if EA wants to internally kind of have, like, their competitor to it all, right? They got their Battlefield, which is, like, their super open-world, massive, large-scale battle kind of game. They have Titanfall, which is, like, their Call of Duty kind of competitor game. And then maybe they want Marcus Leto to make a kind of more, like, arena shooter sandboxy game. Maybe they were like, hey, we want you to make some kind of, like, Halo-type game so that at EA they can have a trifecta of, like, oh, we got a Battlefield, we got a Call of Duty, we got a Halo, whatever. Now, that's just some, like, wild conjecture, but that's an interesting thought nonetheless, right? Is that, you know, if they're going to double down on more first-person shooters, considering they already have a lot of FPS devs, then they obviously want to be going for something else. They got the Battle Royale covered with Apex. They got the big, massively multiplayer kind of thing covered with Battlefield. So maybe they want something a little more nimble. Maybe they want something a little more arena-focused or something a little more uh, casual. Maybe, they, maybe they're like, hey, Titanfall is dead because, it, because Respawn's working on Apex. So can you guys do a more general shooter game? I don't know. It would be really interesting to see what they come up with, though. Because especially when you look at Marcus Leto's track record, he does a lot of sci-fi. He does a lot of, like armor and future looking guns and post-apocalyptic and desolate looking kind of games he doesn't do a lot of like military boots on the ground make your mama proud american military shooters so i don't see him making like a traditional kind of military fps so it'll be really curious to see what he has up in store what what this team becomes and where they go from here i love this i'm i'm excited for this i'm happy for marcus and uh i'm really excited to see where they go from here EA looks to be like they're trying to make some right moves. They're trying to get better. Surprisingly, they've been one of the better players of the big three. You know, Activision with all the legal troubles, Ubisoft with all the identity crisis. But like EA's kind of doing all right at this moment. I mean, at any given time, whoever's on top can start sucking. Whoever sucks can start being good. You know, maybe Activision will be good next year. Who fucking knows? But for right this moment, it seems like EA's making a lot of half decent moves. In a time where like Activision and Ubisoft are kind of fucking it up. So our penultimate story here before we get into the wrap up again from VGA. This is a follow up to last week's story about. And I know this isn't really fun for a lot of you guys because we're like Halo fans and Fable fans. But like FIFA is a big deal. It's a massive one of the best selling games. FIFA, the governing body of football and the license behind the biggest sports game in the world are suggesting it's open to working with these video with other video game companies. 
In a new statement, FIFA set to widen gaming and esports portfolio, which we talked about last week, um, asserting that FIFA is now bullish and optimistic about long-term future in gaming and esports following the comprehensive strategic assessment of the game's interactive entertainment market. Basically saying, EA pays a lot of fucking money for the FIFA license, but if we can get, we either gotta do one of two things. Get EA to pay way more money for this license, or go make a lot more money by using this license in more places than just EA and their exclusive deal. So we already knew about that. That's kind of what we talked about last week. But the story is expanding. It's getting spicier and juicier. Because the post goes on to say that FIFA is engaged with the various industry players, including developers, investors, and analysts, to build out a long-term view of gaming, esports, and interactive entertainment. Notably, FIFA 22, the most recent game in the franchise, is not mentioned in this release at all. This is the latest in a series of back and forth between FIFA and EA, developer of the video game, um, which has also dominated the football video game genre for decades. On October 7th, EA's press release revealed that the publisher was reviewing its licensing agreement with FIFA. The statement implies that there were that were the company to tie to cut ties with FIFA and rename the series. It would still retain the other league, the players, the stadium licenses, because all those are reported reportedly separate from the FIFA license, which we all know they already renewed back in, I believe, September. This was followed on October 11th with the news that EA had filed multiple trademark applications for EA Sports FC. So we already talked about this last week, so I don't want to get into this too much. It's kind of why I put it down at the bottom, despite it being a big deal. But EA's current 10-year with FIFA naming deal expires after next year's Qatar World Cup. And there's a lot of, like, human rights kind of criticism about doing FIFA World Cup there. Just about, like, like legitimate, like what is it, like slave labor and just all this terrible treatment of people just to like build the stadium and to get this place ready for FIFA's World Cup. So there's a lot of like news and not great shit kind of being spread about the fact that they're going to do a FIFA World Cup here. But anyway, we won't get into that aspect because it's not as much pertinent to the to the to the story except to say that, you know, EA might want to maybe distance themselves from FIFA if FIFA's in a situation where they're getting some kind of like pushback for, you know, some uh, for some relationship ties with where they're doing business and things like that, that on top of EA already wanting to get away from FIFA just to save the money and try to get richer is maybe all the reason they need to cut ties and not renew the license. Seems like EA is pretty aggressive about wanting to cut ties, but the problem is the trademark name they came up with was EA Sports FC, which is just the worst fucking name for a sports game. If you go from being EA Sports, from being FIFA to EA Sports FC, man, I can't imagine that that doesn't hurt the brand because when you when it comes to FIFA, yes, FIFA is a big game because it is the the quality soccer game, but also because its name is FIFA. Like you know that name means something, and so if EA doesn't have that name, but then you know like Konami, who's trying to get in the soccer industry, the soccer games business. You know, if they manage to get that license after EA declines to renew, then man, oh man, like that's going to be rough because people are going to buy the game called FIFA or buy the game with the FIFA branding. Um, whereas if, um, you know, if like if we if we're in a situation here where EA is ostensibly making the same great FIFA game they've always made, but now it's called EA Sports FC, they really run the risk of uh, of just kind of alienating a lot of their audience and confusing people and, and potentially making this a less successful product than it generally is. And this is a game that makes so much fucking money for EA. You, you would think like, why mess with a good thing? Just keep that license. You absolutely need it in order to keep selling this game. But they seem to think that they're going to be fine without it because it looks like we're basically on track for exactly that to happen for cut for ties to be cut and for FIFA to go on and do other things. And for EA to change the name of it just so that they don't have to pay this licensing money, which is absurd when you consider how much money they're fucking making off FIFA. Um, it really makes no re mo no sense why they shouldn't just pay the license and play it safe going forward. But nonetheless, they want to try to save money as much as possible where they can because that's that's big corporations for you. But we'll continue to follow that story as it develops further. But that's our update on it for now. And then just to wrap up, we got some uh, Game Pass information, some new games coming and going. So coming soon to Game Pass on October 21st, we got Dragon Ball Fighter Z on cloud and console. We got Echo Generation on Cloud Console and PC. And we got Everspace 2 on Game Preview for PC. On October 28th, we got Age of Empires 4 on PC. Of course, new first-party game. Also on October 28th, 
Alan Wake's American Nightmare on console and PC. That's coming back. Backbone on console, Bassmaster Fishing 2022, Cloud Console and PC, and Non Guns Doppelganger Edition, Cloud Console and PC. Finally, The Forgotten City comes out October 28th, Cloud Console and PC. Now, leaving on Halloween, October 31st, we're losing a couple games. We've got Carto, Cloud Console and PC, Celeste, Cloud Console and PC. Real quick interje interjection. If you have not played Celeste, play Celeste. You have between now and Halloween. This game is so goddamn good. I played on Switch a few years ago. It was my train game for a while. Celeste is so good. The gameplay is so good. The story is so good. The music is phenomenal. Celeste is such a good game. Play Celeste. All right. Comanche. Comanche. PC leaving on October 31st. We're also losing E-Shade on Cloud Console and PC. Five Nights at Freddy's Cloud Console and PC. Knights and Bikes, Cloud Console and PC, and Unruly Heroes, Cloud Console and PC. Funny that we're losing Five Nights at Freddy's on Halloween. But guys, that's going to do it for all the news this week. It's a chunky, long-ass news week. What I fucking tell you? We're over two hours in, but we're not done yet. we got to jump into our important enough news stories. These are news stories important enough to make the podcast not quite important enough to warrant their own discussion. So we got a handful. First is that C CD Projekt Red has delayed the Xbox Series X and S version of Cyberpunk 2077, as well as their Xbox Series X and S version of Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, to sometime in 2022. The statement reads that apologies for the extended wait... Uh, but they want to make it right, blah, blah, blah. It's scheduled for the first... Cyberpunk is coming the first half, the first quarter of the year. Witcher 3 is planned for the second quarter of 2022. Whatever. We'll see them when we see them. Xbox Series X, next story. Xbox Series X and S have cleared 100,000 consoles sold in Japan, putting the platform on, on course to clear the lifetime sales of the Xbox One in Japan in just one year. According to the latest Famitsu sales data, Series S sold 29, sorry, 2,920 units, and Xbox Series X sold 527 units during the week ending October 10th. This bringing the combined lifetime total sales to 102,591, 64,284 for Series X, 38,307 for Series S. Now, in comparison, it, it looks like Microsoft's previous console, 220 weeks, 4.5 years, to reach 100. Thousand sales milestone was in November 2018 for the Xbox One generation of consoles. So it took four and a half years for them to reach that milestone with Xbox One. They're about to hit it in a year with Xbox Series S and X. Also interesting to note, while the Series S sold better in more recently in Japan, the X has better, way better lifetime sales, which tells you that the the temporary better sales of the Series S were due to availability and not preference of the market i assume so that's interesting next uh the release date for from software's highly anticipated elden ring has been delayed just over a month the game will now release on february 25th 2022 boohoo sledgehammer games the developer behind call of duty vanguard the game coming out next month is opening a new office in the uk it is the guilford studio and will support call of duty vanguard's live seasons as well as future projects that have planned for the years ahead, the company said in a blog announcing it. The newly formed team is currently hiring all positions, blah, 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 in the UK. So, guys, I will just note that Infinity Ward just got a new team in Texas last week. So, lots of new Call of Duty studios, huh? No more, no more Tony Hawk games, though. All right, Outriders is coming to Microsoft Store on Windows and Game Pass for PC on October 19th. Just a note, so it's already out. Rainbow Six Extraction, the PvE co-op game, Ubisoft, whatever, previously called Rainbow Soft Quarantine, may have a new release date according to a Ubisoft website post. The game was originally supposed to release in September, but has been pushed back to January. However, no firm release date was given. According to a recent update page on Ubisoft's website, the release date is January 20th, 2022. Ubisoft has not quite confirmed this date. It seems like it could have just been a leak or a mistake. The blog post, which was initially posted on June of 2021, has seemingly been updated recently, um, potentially in advance of a full announcement. So we'll have to wait and see. Windows Central is reporting that Microsoft have announced that Game Pass Ultimate subscribers will get exclusive access to monthly rewards in Halo Infinite as part of Game Pass Ultimate Perks program. The program will give Xbox Game Pass Ultimate subscribers unique in-game bonuses and perks, inviting members to stay and subscribe. The blog post notes that spe uh, specifically mentions mo monthly multiplayer bonuses, 
uh, special cosmetic unlocks and things like that. Possibly new armor coatings, weapon coatings, and charms. Other types of customization items. Players may also get access to extra consumables like XP boosts and swappable challenges as well. And next, Windows Central reports that the height of Minecraft Live 2021 has happened and the announcements include the Wild Update, which is the next big Minecraft update following the full release of Caves and Cliffs, which is just about to happen. So stay tuned for more information on that in 2022. And then finally, Xbox have announced Microsoft Flight Simulator Game of the Year Edition alongside a release date for the game's first major expansion. The Game of the Year Edition will release on November 18th, November 18th as a free update for existing players, including Game Pass members. It will include five new aircraft, eight new fresh coats of paint, new missions, tutorials, an updated weather system, and DX12 support. Flight Simulator Game of the Year Edition will be released alongside the first major expansion, Reno Air Races, which will be which will bring the STIHL National Championship Air Race and Competitive Multiplayer Racing to the title. Wow, I can't wait. But guys, it's going to do it for all of our news this week. Holy shit, that was a big week, wasn't it? You guys are tired? I'm tired. Fuck, I talked so much, my head's about to fall off. There are 22 new games coming to Xbox this week. Xbox, chill the fuck out. It used to be Xbox on, Xbox off, Xbox go home, Xbox snap. Remember snap? I miss snap. It was a great feature. Please bring it back. Now I say Xbox, chill the fuck out. Stop with all the news and the new games. I can't, I can't even find time to wipe my ass, let alone play half these games, you know? But of the new games coming out, just a couple things I want to note. A couple things you might be like, oh, that's coming out. Toy Soldier HD, Ghoul Boy, looks like a nice little Halloween game. House of Ashes, Dark Picture Anthology, uh, October 22nd, Optimizer Series X and S, Smart Delivery. That's one you might be interested in. It's, I think the third or the fourth entry in the Dark Pictures Anthology. Yeah, My Friend Peppa Pig on October 22nd, that's cute. But yeah, n nothing really notable. This week, just a bunch of small indie games. You can check it out on Xbox Wire if you're interested in more of that. Uh, but Games of Gold, as a reminder for October, we got Arrow for the rest of the month. Hover from now until November 15th. Castlevania, Army of Despair. Eh, you missed it. I think I missed it. I think I meant to... I forgot to download that one. And then from now until October 31st, you got Resident Evil Code Veronica X. Guys, I'm not even going to try to be cute. That's going to do it for this week's episode. I'm fucking tired. I got I to gotta edit this beast. You guys, your energy, your comments, your silliness gives me the energy to keep going at night. So please, don't forget to comment. Don't forget to leave five stars on YouTube. Or not YouTube. Apple, iTunes, podcasts, whatever, it really does help. So I really would appreciate it. If you if you can, if you have the means to, I'd, I'd, I'd greatly appreciate that. Also, please just um, follow on Twitter at Jesse DeRosa. Follow on Twitch at Lightning Extreme or twitch.tv slash Lightning Extreme. Subscribe on YouTube, whatever. Let me know what you think. Constructive criticism, always welcome. Suggestions for the show, for the stream, for the YouTube, whatever. I love your feedback. I appreciate you guys' comments. I always appreciate hearing from you guys. It is legitimately the best part of the show is getting to interact with you guys and feel like I'm not talking to a wall by myself all the time. So thank you all so much for your support. And uh, until next week, power your streams.
This is what happens. 